So without any further ado, we will hear from our speaker. Holy Reza. We wash our own dishes too, by the way. Hi folks. Hi. Nice to see you again. Uh, I, I've been like 10 or 12 years since I've done one of these. Uh, probably pre-911. Okay. So all the uh, outlandish uh, rants and raves and alarmist things that I said then, then you can read in every day today's paper. They've pretty much come to fruition. Everything we were warning everybody about was going to happen. Now we're in a nice world-class mess all the way around. Anyway, uh, my presentation tonight is about the work I do, which basically is uh, modern-day free school education. This is uh, what I do. I provide publications uh, by, for, and with prisoners. So we're basically the prison industrial complex's worst nightmare because we actually attempt to educate the slaves, and you know how this good slave-based government hates that. Um, we've heard about, uh, well remember, look at NATO. You, you folks marched at NATO during the spring? Yeah. That was the most surreal, psychotic thing I've ever gone through in the city here. And uh, one of my friends was one of the preemptive arrestees. Uh, and there was another guy, you might have heard about him, his name is uh, Sebastian Senekowitz. He was the Polish uh, anarchist who was uh, uh, arrested also as one of the NATO Five. Well, I just got a letter from him. I'm going to read you a little bit of it. He says, I'm not sure if you've heard, but I copped out on November 6th thinking that I was being sentenced to a 120-day program in boot camp. Yeah, this Unfortunately, due to my in immigration hold, I was not eligible for boot camp and I'm now stuck in Sumner, Illinois at Lawrence Correctional Center serving a four-year sentence at 100%. What the... What the fuck is right? F America, F the prison system, F Rahm Emanuel, F Anita Alvarez, F McCarthy, F Cook County Sheriff Tom Dart, and last but not least, F Obama. It's kind of funny that it's my first time being in prison and they sent me to a maximum security disciplinary joint. What you, what you and the ABCs around the world do is amazing and I just started to help make for the Northwest ABC back in March and I was still kind of new to the whole prisoner support outreach idea. Now I realize what a big role ABCs play in the daily lives of incarcerated people. This guy, as you recall, his big crime, he he got drunk with a snitch who was wired and they were joking around and he mentioned something about he was going to put a bomb in a Harry Potter book. Four bucks for a joke. That's what, that's what this insane country has come to. You can't really say what you want to say, but I'm going to say it tonight, I'll tell you that. Here, here. So anyway, you know, I grew up, I always hated bullies. As a kid, I hate. I couldn't stand people being mean to other people. Of course, I have a couple of abusive older brothers. I would break up fights. I would tell people, "You can't call people that way. You got to treat people with respect." So ever since I was a little kid, I couldn't stand bullies, which is basically why I detest the U.S. government, because all it is is an endless litany of mass genocide, brutality, incarceration, slavery, and bullying every country in the world. Now look at what we have. We have basically the whole world is melting on us now, and, and yeah, we're supposed to think that we live in this wonderful free democracy. Well, the people that suffer from, from this society are in some of the most oppressed and miserable people in the world. The treatment meted out to them—it's unbelievable. We got clinical torture chambers in all the prisons now. As part of the we have. We have separate control unit prisons where the whole point is to, to drive the prisoners insane. And sure enough, they drive prisoners insane. They drive everybody insane. Look what happened yesterday. A great philosopher once said, a country gets the, prison, the, the criminals that they deserve. These insane criminals in this country now, they take their feud from Washington. You know, look at, look at the president, the smiling assassin. 
He's assassinating people all over the world, country after country after country. They've blown up the wedding party. That's the same thing as what happened to that kindergarten yesterday. Do we care about those people? No, we don't. We're brainwashed into only caring about us while our government is out murdering people, starving people to death, forcing people to migrate to this country, try to run through the desert to survive while right-wing nuts are taking bottles of water that have been set out for them and, and think that this is our country. You know, the people on the Mayflower were illegal. So anyway, as I got older, it was a wonderful time in the 60s, you know, fantastic. Malcolm X, Abby Hoffman, they were genuine, serious leaders that were saying real things. You could see what was going on TV. There was soldiers in Vietnam standing next to cordwood stacks of bodies that they murdered, acting like they did something wonderful. You don't see that anymore. That's all gone. Everyone, everything's been embedded. Everybody's been washed out. There's no more racism anymore, remember? The Civil Rights Movement. Yeah, there's mass incarceration going on right now. The black community, one third of the black men in their 20s are either on parole, or in prison, or uh, probation. It's sickening, it's unbelievable. It's, it's off the charts as far as mass incarceration. It's beyond Stalinist, Gulag, Archipelago, China, you name a country, we've blown by that way since. Yeah, that's why we go and raid the, the colleges all the time and, and get all those drug do users and dealers. We, we raid the kid on the corner selling a rock of crack. That's who we raid. You go to prison, you go to court, it's, it's blacks and, and Chicanos. If a, if a black kid doesn't have a lawyer, he's getting 10 years. Automatically. Anyway, so, you know... I, I went through all that period, uh, you know, it was exhilarating in some places, it was, uh, sometimes it was very effective, there was a, a very strong prison, prison uh, generated wave of, of resistance to this government. They did free Huey Newton, they did a lot of things, but sure enough, the, this, this insane war on drugs spearheaded this mass incarceration that we see today. And so. You know, I wasn't happy with what I saw out there. I was, you could hardly find a, a real truth. Anyone with guts to talk, talk the truth, real truth. So I decided, well, I'm gonna have to figure out how I'm gonna do this because this is unacceptable. People need and deserve to be told the truth, which young people most certainly are not being told. And that's why they get themselves in these hideous situations. And, and just make it prime targets to be to picked up and locked up and thrown out and used and abused and then spit back out into the neighborhood without any warning to anybody with nothing there for them except blockade after blockade, illegal, everything he does is he can't do, he can't vote, he can't, can't work, he can't live, he can't do this. What is he supposed to do? He's going to get reincarcerated somehow. It, it, you know, the fire will come to a fire, they don't pour gas on the fire, they pour water on the fire. But if you incarcerate people and bitter and bitter them, torture them, abuse them, and then spit them back out into the society, you're asking for it. They're, it's just like the 20s during the prohibition of alcohol. It just turns into a violent mess. So what we, I decided that it needs to be done is the people that are, are willing and able to articulate what's going on in a modern day reality, not the garbage on TV, not the, this, this, not the internet, from the, those that are oppressed directly. Well, they know, they see it 24-7 what's really going on, what this country is doing. And basically what, what happens in prison finds its way out to the outs. They use the latest drugging techniques, the repression techniques, the tasering, the, the mass corralling of people, and it, it, it finds its way out into the streets, and now you see them tasering people and stunning them and, and all these wild weapons they have to control crowds and, 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 and just keep this despicable society going the way it is, where the rich are getting insanely richer and the poor are, are, are funneled into prison, into the streets, under the viaducts. There's no, <laughs> there's no mental hospitals anymore. 
The biggest mental hospital in this state is Cook County Jail, just as Rikers Island is in New York. It's, just, it's, it's vile as hell. It's, it's actually the Achilles heel of this whole, whole system, the slave-based system. I say that because the 13th Amendment, which allegedly abolished slavery, had a little caveat on the bottom. Unless you're convicted of a felony, well, they just convict millions and millions of people of felonies. So what this has actually morphed into is a whole new genre of spirited, brilliant, powerful literature that affects people and changes people's lives. I know it doesn't matter to a crowd like this, but to prisoners, their families, poor people, people that actually want to have a future, young people, it strikes home because they know they're being told the truth and they know they're being leveled with and, and uh, being doing this it's every single day for, for like 15 years now. I've amassed uh, about 700 different publications on all kinds of subjects, most specifically geared uh, for prisoners. Most of the time, in collaboration with them, written by them, uh, drawn by them, incredible artwork. And so we're, we're developing the new resistance of today, you know. It's coming out of the prisons. It's coming out of the, the poverty-stricken, abused areas all over this country. Yeah, we got a police state here, and, 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 and dissension can be hit hard, and, and leaders and, and bold thinkers will, will be repressed and, and set up and, you know, given all kinds of garbage charges and harassed and, and menaced constantly. That's the way it is. That's just the reality we got to deal with. So what we're doing is we're going right, right to the bottom of the, of the the sub-basement of the underground, where, just like yesterday, where they tasered that guy and his sister said the cops treated him like an insect. We're going to all the insects, all the people that are abused on a daily basis, and, and leveling with them and say, look, here's the real truth. Here's what the government is really all about. Here's the history of, of people that fought this government. Slave rebellions, black power movements, Indian rebellions, worker rebellions. Here's the real truth history, and here's what these people had to say. And here's what we're saying today about what's going on. So we're representing opposition to this world brutal government that is based in Washington and, and has a military bases damn near every country in the world and has been involved in genocides from Vietnam to Cambodia to El Salvador to Indonesia, Africa, Asia, South America, North America, you name it. Millions of people have been murdered and butchered in their lives, destroyed by this government. Well, they're not all trying to come here. A lot of them are and have. And, and have for a long time all different kinds of people, but you're probably talking about the wave of Hispanics coming up, forced out of their own subsistence farming from the machinations of NAFTA and the manipulations of the of the, the rice and the beans uh, markets, corn. Where were they supposed to go? They went to Mexico City, and then they went to the border where they, they first brought the dollar on our wage factories. But that wasn't good enough. They sent them on to Indonesia. Singapore, uh, Pakistan, China, Vietnam. So they moved up to this country. You know, the whole Southwest used to be North Mexico until they were gunned off of it by the U.S. government. They were there for thousands of years, not just a couple hundred. This imperialist government has, has treated people horribly, even during the Great World War II. Do you read, do you read about what they did in Dresden? Cologne, all these cities, they just obliterated tens and hundreds of thousands of citizens. Oh yeah, sure they did. Well, the Nazi government did, but the citizens said, well, what I'm talking about, we murdered German people for no damn reason. They all put Hitler, help put Hitler in. Well, yeah, we put our own Hitlers in too, didn't we? Nixon, Reagan, Clinton, Bush, 
Obama. Obama, yeah, he'll Obama you all right. He, when he was talking the first time of being president, he was already talking about, well, I might have to invade Iran. We haven't gotten around to that yet. Gee, aren't we lucky? It's only got, what, six wars going on now? And this is the liberal, the real fascists. Oh, they can't, the rich can't be rich enough, fast enough. The poor can't be thrown in the streets fast enough. This is what you're accepting? Disgusting. Malcolm X had a, had a few very poignant things to say before he was executed. He said, the masses need to find their humanity and then they'll move. He also said, I was in prison. Yeah, it's no surprise I was in prison. Everybody's been in prison. That's what America means, prison. <laughs> That was in 1961, before the insane explosion of prison. And then, then one day it all came home to me in a personal way. My son's best friend, this brilliant, brilliant symphony orchestra quality piano player, 17 years old, was murdered by a drunken off-duty cop down in the suburbs where I live. Sure enough, the old buddy system, the you know, the, the cover-up was on from the, the second he was taking his last dying breaths. It was just disgusting as hell, and I knew it was going to happen. First, they didn't Can even test him until the next morning. They acted like he was the victim yeah. until it took him home, you know. Julian? No. It was horrible. Oh. Absolutely horrible. And then there was a witness who was actually a graf graphics designer, and he wrote... So a three-page eyewitness account and drew a picture of what exactly happened. Of but the police just ignored him and, you know, they go away. They came to the parents' house that night and told them, your son will cause this accident and, you know, it's his fault, he's dead, and he, who cares, he's roadkill. Never mentioned there was a, a witness. Yeah. We had to flyer that whole area. I flyered it like crazy. And sure enough, the witness came to the to the wake where there was hundreds of kids because this kid was an incredibly talented like the great football player Crete now has just that level of talent and he told us what happened so I said are you willing to talk to a lawyer about this and sure enough I set him up with a high octane loop lawyer to sue him at least in civil court and then we put the squeeze on our, our you know, local politicians to insist that the Will County State's Attorney at least go through the motions of uh, investigating it. And they did. They, they decided, no, we can't really charge him with anything but a couple of misdemeanor traffic violations. Although we did find out he was going between 83 and 100 miles an hour when he T-boned him at the intersection. Oh, that's good. You know. Yeah, they charged him. They did... <laughs> they did... Convict him of speeding. That was it. Dead 17 year old, drunken cop, speeding. And he got off on all the other charges. Kind of funny, uh, the bailiff was the judge's mother. That's what they do in Will County. How do they do it in Joliet? But that, and then after that, the, the kid that. Someone killed his three-year-old daughter, and they imprisoned him for it. And he got a big judgment out of Wilmington, and then the Peterson thing, and then there's all these other cases in Will County. You know, all, all having to do with cops killing people, basically, or incompetently charging the wrong person. But anyway, I got a passion for injustice. I hate it. I can't stand it, and I will not tolerate it. I don't like crime. I can't stand people being mean to anybody. I don't want anybody being hurt about anything. And I don't tolerate, you know, I don't condone criminal behavior or, uh, you know, and they know they know how I feel about things, you know. I've gained their respect in the, in the prison world because of my steadfast dedication to this whole thing. But criminals aren't, aren't born. They're made. Society makes them. This is a demented social system. It's 
it's a domestic economic system, but it, the social reality growing up in this country is, is poison. It's poison. And you get the abscesses like yesterday with just insane mass murder. But then, why is that so horrible? But if the government does it, it's okay, even though they do it on a hundred times scale every day. Why is it okay to abuse somebody and stick them in a cage, 16-year-old kid, subject him to being assaulted by whoever, guards, other prisoners, put him in adult prisons, but you feel the most revulsion if you find a demented parent sticking their kid in the closet or hooking them to a bed or something, treating them like a dog. But it's okay the government treats people, human beings, like dogs. 2.3 million of them on a daily basis, every single day. And it floats in and out. They release tens of thousands of people every day. And they arrest tens of thousands of people every day, too. So you got this constant degenerating influence on society, destroying families, destroying psyches, and, and turning people into, into monsters a lot of times. And, and yet, we, we don't have money to, to deal with any of this. We don't have any money to, 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 for drug rehabilitation. No, throw them in there uh, instead, you know. So, feed them full of these hideous pills that will drive anybody utterly insane. <laughs> Now, just like everything else in this advanced, degenerating capitalist society, the whole thing is privatization. Yeah. Well, you got to privatize. We got to make all these jobs. We got to do this. We got to do that. We got to spend all this money that no one has. We're going to build a, an airport. We're going to build a, a private tollway. We're going to build private immigration. We're going to build private prisons. So some, you know. Emotionally and, and morally, absolutely corrupt millionaires can make further millions off, off human beings, a human meat market. But it's nice, it's hidden behind walls of cotton sartina wire, so we don't really have to watch it. And the gut and the, the reporters don't go in, they're not allowed to go in this. So we don't know, we don't care what's going on in there or how it affects everything else. Oh, they did something wrong, and they smoked a joint. Give them 20 years. A lot of guys are still in jail for the insane amount of time like that. Things are changing about that, but there's still hundreds of thousands of people in the premier possession of marijuana, which is a wild medicinal plant that's been around for thousands of years. The only reason it was declared illegal because William Randolph Hearst ran a campaign because he had for us. He wanted his papers printed on wood pulp, not not uh, hemp. And so, yeah, what, what are we going to do? Let's demonize the blacks as usual. That'll get things going. Get the jazz players that smoke it. And then, <laughs> now you got hundreds of thousands and millions of people who went through it because of it. For what? What good did any of that do? It just further eroded the, the legitimacy of this whole society. It sure as hell hasn't stopped anybody from smoking pot either. But you look at the hard stuff, heroin, crack, where did this stuff come from? And then if you study the history of how this thing came to be so prevalent in the inner cities, then you realize how disgusting the government is involved in this collusion. Big banks, big industry, millions, billions of dollars, offshore banks. They never catch the big guys, the, you know, it's always the, the schmoes. The, the, the gang bangers in the city that, and their little runners that get, get tagged. Where did this stuff originate from? The Corsican Mafia, the Marseille Mafia, right after World War II, through the, the uh, Triangle, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, all when we were over there, we were sending all this shit here. Same thing in Afghanistan. It went wild once we took over the country. And the cocaine did that too, Central and South America. Got to fund those Contras. <laughs> and, and they think about what this government's really involved in for other countries. Training death squads. 
How sick is that? Training death squads. Here, the future leaders of Central and South America will teach how to torture and murder your own people. So we, we did the research on it, and uh, we wrote about it. And plus we wrote whatever the hell we felt like writing. Or whatever bothered us about anything. So it's a whole new uh, genre of literature, like I said. Some of it's incredibly written. Some of these people are very talented. A lot of people in prison are extremely talented. Of course, there's a lot of problems with them, too. It's not an easy collaboration. And we're constantly being, being messed with. My, my collaborators, are they find out what they're doing, and they decide, well, this is, this is gang-related activity. Uh, you're going to have to go to a control unit now. You're going to be in a shoe. We're going to confiscate all your papers. We're going we're gonna to beat you. We're going to taser you. We're going to do all kinds of horrible things to you. And no one's going to be, be the wiser. And then you probably get six months tacked on because we're going to claim that you attacked a guard. When in fact, what they do, they send goon squads all dressed to the nines like Ninja Turtles. They gas the, 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 the cell out, and then they start to commence the beatings and the bone breaking. And it's despicable. The people that were ran uh, Abu Ghraib, they didn't use the military police. Uh, you know, they weren't good enough torturers. They went right to, to the top, the U.S. prison system. Grainer, Lieutenant Grainer, who was one of the main guys, about the only guy that got touched, tagged a little bit a couple of years, I think, for what happened in Abu Ghraib. He was, he was a big shot prisoner, torture type guy in uh, Pennsylvania prisons. But all through these, all these, these behind the scenes prisons where they do this insane, constant waterboarding of these guys. And, oh, we can't know about any of that. We can't let reporters talk about that or go in there. We'll have a, a couple vetted Fox News reporters with, with the battalion here and there, and we'll send a little watered-down report now and then so you won't know what's going on or how many people the U.S. government has actually murdered, how many people they forced to starvation, caused a dying, hideous death because of sanctions and lack of drinking water and basic medicines. How'd you like that Clinton years? Those were fun, weren't they? 6,000 kids a week killed because of the sanctions. This just happens country after country after country. And it's, and it's time that the people in this country stop being so, so gutless and so non-caring about the future of the whole world. And not to mention the psychological development of their own children. If they're going to gloss over all this and just accept things and live out the string and look, yeah, go alone, let, let the ice polar caps melt and I'll be dead by then. What do I care? Well, I got two sons and one of my sons' his wife is going to have a baby next month. That means... You know, hopefully that child will live 80 years or whatever. What is going to be, what is going to happen in 80 years from now at this rate if we don't do anything? 40 years. Yeah, 40 years. I mean, things are deteriorating rapidly now. Very rapidly. And, and the, the whole political machine that we're supposed to, you know, be content to walk through and deal with. Everyone knows it's, it's rigged as hell and there's no chance that real people have any influence. They're going to lie to you, get elected, get slated, get blah blah, throw a million dollars at yard signs and, and tell people how to vote and rig, rig machines or do whatever it is. It doesn't really matter, tweedledee dee, tweedledee dum, Democrat, Republican, two sides of the same damn coin. They're both boss parties. They're both going to push big business. And, any, and the basic imperialist agenda that's been going on for decades. There's only, the only thing we can hope to try to do is, is build
collectives that can help ourselves and, no, and whoever's involved in them, you know? But you can't really do anything until you realize what the hell's going on and develop a resolve that's going to actually lead to proactive activity that's going to actually help somebody. You know, I do a lot, I spend a lot of time doing this, but I do a lot of the regular stuff too. I uh, spearhead grassroots groups, I started, I co-founded the group fighting the Pietone Airport, and I'm outreach coordinator for STAND, which I named the acronym, which stands for Shut This Airport Nightmare Down. We've been fighting the Pietone Airport for decades now, but now they're trying to run, a, trying to fast track a, a privately run tollway through, from, from Shanahan, which is just uh, west of Joliet, off 55. For later? All the way past okay. Lowell, Indiana on 65. Privately run by Ford, Ford Consortium, which is how they perceive the Piaton Airport is going to be run. Privately, foreign owned, as the Indiana toll road already is. Yeah, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of assaults going on on the citizens down where I am, just like there is everywhere else. They're also trying to shove up Immigration Detention Center we shut the one down in Crete. I was fundamentally involved in that one. But now they want to stick it in Joliet. And that's, a, that's another problem, of course. One of many. But what, what ICE is trying to do, ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, is the police arm of the Homeland Security. They're the ones that are kidnapping all these so-called illegals and deporting them. A clip twice the rate of, of W. 400,000 people a year have been deported under Obama. The great Obama. 400,000. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of families destroyed. Because it's the mothers and the fathers that are being deported. The kids are naturalized citizens being born here. So what, what's the point of destroying all these families? Millions of families. What's the point? Well, they're illegal. So they want to build five regional detention centers, like the one in Crete was supposed to cover the whole Midwest, because they, they wanted uh, the detention center to be within a uh, an hour and a half of their their regional office, which in this case is in Chicago's Loop. So now they're going to try to Joliet. Well, I was at a meeting a couple nights ago there, and there's like 500 people there, and they're, they don't want to see this happen. They don't want their their family and friends being deported. For what? Because they exist. What's their crime? Well, they're here. They weren't born here. You know. We got to destroy the family now. Well, weren't we all from somewhere else too? Sometime before we got here, whether in a galley of a slave ship or coming across the Atlantic, fleeing the British, starving the Irish, or from wars in Europe, or whatever. Anybody deserves to be anywhere they want to be. There's no real borders. It's ridiculous. It's all contrived. Governments are figments. They're nothing. They don't exist. Power does because power is able to, to hurt people. It doesn't do anything, anybody any good. But it can hurt people. Like, like uh, government cannot create rights. They're natural. Everyone has rights of various things. Their life, their freedom. The government can only take away your rights. I'm going to read you a few uh, sort of testimonies from prisoners about, you know, interactions with, about this uh, educational service that I provide. I'm an indigent prisoner serving 30 years in a Louisiana prison. I want these means to teach myself, to stand up for myself, and help others realize that we are much more than just cattle. I want to become a serious anarchist. I have no anarchist literature, no radical literature. Alfred McGlory, Angie, Louisiana. Your letter pulled me from my dark mood as I always as I'm as always, you kick that high octane word my way. I have been learning a great deal from your zines. Developing oneself isn't easy, but I try. You're exactly right. We've all been blindsided by the lies and cynical bullshit we've been taught or picked up as a bad habit. 
I like ABC because you open the eyes up to the false reality we live in. Time to get out of that comfort zone and get a reality check. One thing I don't understand is why when the citizens fight for their rights, the mass majority looks down on those who truly fight for freedom. Every conversation I ever held about anarchy and the overthrow of all governments, individuals say the world cannot exist without laws, etc., and the so-called America is the best country in the world. I bring up class oppression, racism, homelessness, and other things. They say, well, go somewhere else. Like that's the answer to the problem. I find it hard to break free of these restraints my oppressor has placed upon me. All my life I've been told how to think, and to finally think for myself is like brain damage. Since we've been writing, I've been in constant thinking mode. Your zines help out a lot on enlightening me. My mindset has gradually changed, and I look beyond the bullshit laid out before me like some treasure. You shared with me an open door, and to refuse it would be dramatic. <coughs> this is where I'm at at this moment. It's weird how precious a moment like this can be, and how valuable a decision that will alter my life. My present day circumstances and situations have changed the course of my life. I heard this in a song. Make your next move your best move. That's what I want to do, because I'm tired of being sucked into these death holes. John Goins, Polkton, North Carolina. Dear Anthony, hope you are well. As for me, doing the best I can. I need more scenes. <laughs> See here. Brother Rinson, you could not have been more right in your assessment of gangs. Brother, because the system seems to understand how to keep them preoccupied with their own self-destruction by making sure they're cultivated around hopelessness, and that is done by maintaining a constant flow of oppression within their communities. By utilizing the tools of oppression, guns, drugs, alcohol, no education, miseducation, and poverty. These tools of oppression manifest conflicts and one, when one does not have the necessary tools, i.e. education, to work out their problems, then their ignorance will win out, you dig? The dragnet is to classify every criminal act as gang activity. Therefore, you're able to have a bigger pool of individuals, which allows the surplus that is needed to fulfill the quota for the prison industrial complex. This is why the poor are sought and classified as gangs, we're on drugs, terrorists, etc. It's because this is the pool that feeds the militarized police departments, which is why the gang terrorist intelligence officers utilize strategies, tactics to entrap and lure. Nobody in these poor drug and gang infested communities have access to assault rifles, Uzis, high caliber pistols, etc. Drugs, heroin, PCP, pills, etc., alcohol are established in the many liquor stores within these impoverished communities. So it's a very important genocide, and the poor have always been the most vulnerable in our society. So they are the target. I try to educate the poor, non-poor, wherever they will listen, because corporate America and the U.S. government have no mercy for no one but themselves. You heard Mitt Romney. He meant what he said in private and goes around to try to make sense of it. Their badge of honor is to exploit the poor, to coalesce the world's wealth under their control, and we are simply servants for the rich. Stooges are always complicit in their own oppression because they are made. James Crawford, Crescent City, he's one of the leaders of the, the, the wave of prison strikes reverberating still through the California prisons. Hello, my name is Jamal Johnson. I was given your address with the notion that you help provide young black men with useful and practical information. I am wondering if copies of When Love is by Choice Instead of Chance by C. Anthony Taylor and Love, Section, Infatuation by Zola Wagona Wazania are available. Also, do you have any other type of self-help material that can bring about a refocus of one's life's agendas for guys like myself trying to wake up and change for the better? Jamal Johnson, Eli Nevada. A good friend gave me your address and told me you have a lot of material on anarchism and other stuff I'd be interested in. He knows I do my best to educate myself to the fullest when it comes to our corrupt government and prison system in the U.S. I got a chance to read a few pages of a zine from Coyote Chef and couldn't believe the mailroom even let it in. They hate the truth in Florida prisons and try their best to keep us from it at all costs. I've been ordering books from a few programs that let us pay with stamps but nothing like your zines that ever caught my eyes or impressed me like this ever before. I am very interested in receiving material from your work. Thanks for standing up for us behind these walls. There are few people out there who will. 
That was Richard Cranford, Live Oak, Florida. Let me begin by thanking you all for making Afro-American history and knowledge available. I'm 33 years old and have felt somewhat ashamed and dejected by the passive and cowardly portrayal of African people in general, but more specifically because the textbooks in all public schools only show African Americans in chains and hanging from trees were standing passively on platforms waiting to be sold. And the only highly publicized struggle that can be easily found anywhere is Martin Luther King Jr.'s disgraceful encouragement for black people to not resist as dogs are being sicked on them, they were being beaten, humiliated in the worst of ways. I don't believe he or people who encourage that type of pacifism looked and looks at the psychological effects that that type of behavior will have most definitely have on those who come after them. Every Native American male I run into fancies himself as a brave warrior. Because any time he opens a book, it will mention how his ancestors fought almost to their point of extinction. And he draws spiritual strength from knowing he comes from a people who will war, murder, and destroy opposition. Because African Americans are presented to mainstream America in the opposite light, look at what the youth think of ourselves. I'm a product of the streets. Mother has been on crack cocaine since a few years after I was born. Never knew my father, and was raised in boys' homes and juvenile facilities. I just recently disassociated myself from gang activities after around 23 years of participation to one extent or another. I'm currently serving a life sentence for a drug-related murder, and all the dudes I bump into, just like me, they are always bragging about how many bloods or crips they've murdered. I've never met a cat that told me a war story about murdering a white man or a police officer, a judge, or any of his oppressors. African-American aggression, for the most part, is directed at <coughs> itself. Oh, he wrote this. <laughs> I didn't. Marcus Johnson, Huntsville, Tennessee, Texas, which is the execution capital of the country. I'll read a couple more for you. Here's, here's an interesting one. I have to see the parole, parole board on January 15th, 96 years from now. What in hell am I supposed to wait for, hope for? I have nothing but my mind, the only place they can't punch, kick, beat, pepper spray, or molest. As I come out of dinner or breakfast, I'm routinely groped, grabbed, half-stripped. How many times per day must I be checked in my balls and ass for fruit or what? Bread? Salad? This is acceptable, but my hand on a shoulder is not. And it's not simply because I care about them, and they hate that. Little do they realize the world they are trying to create would be hell for them, their own end. What would happen if all prisoners were rendered somehow incapable of love? Whether it's romantic friendship or mutual affinity and camaraderie, you said it yourself, Ann, an environment without love or hope is a doomed environment. What do I have if you take from me my love and my hope, pig? I have rage and hate. If you have several million people with only rage and hate directed at you, you have a world of violence and mayhem. Or if I cannot love my Piesno, who is being released shortly. If he is taken from me and I'm surrounded by only homophobic Nazis in green and blue, what reason do I have not to simply act out all of my rage and hatred upon those who have filled me with it? Put a man in irons and keep him immobile. Tell him every day you have done this to him. Laugh at him and what will his reaction be when one day you free him? He will attack you. Better to simply shoot me in the back of the head with your high-powered rifle, pig, and splatter my diseased brain all over the pavement than hold out any hope of ever curing me of being a fucking faggot. Thousand. Cameron to you. I own California. I am writing you from inside Cook County Jail. I am currently in seg with Miggs right now, so we talk every day. He gave me some of the scenes you sent him, and I am inspired every time I read one. I have been active in the movement mainly with Occupy, but since being locked up and after reading the last act of the circus animals, I really want to help out and do a lot of prisoner support work when I get out. Again, I would like to thank you and tell you how much the work you do lifts my spirits here in this cage. I think the work Sean does is amazing, and if he and Travis can get through what they did and still do, then these next four months will be easy. 
Before reading those zines, I was down, and I felt like four months was so long. But after reading some lit, I'm good. But when I get out, I will for sure be contacting you so I can get back what was freely given to me. Much love and thanks. That's Christopher Mathis, Cook County. Most likely, I will be here several years in this concentration camp that I've renamed New Auschwitz. It's suiting, I would say. We're on lockdown every day with the exception of yard days, which is two or three days a week. Yard is nothing more than a dog kennel cage. There's no more group yard at all. They're pretty much attempting to create an anti-social atmosphere, you think? They take note of everything, who talks to who, who exercises together. Human psychological experimentation, that's what it is. I think the word prison may be softened up soon with another euphemism. Maybe they will begin to call these places secured gated communities. Or possibly just gated communities. That's Timothy Trujillo, he's a brilliant writer. I want to let you know what everything you do is appreciated. Us comrades of the struggle see the sincerity in your actions. Keep doing what you're doing, Anthony. Keep agitating the minds of the masses. Peace. Oh, I will, brother. I will. So anyway, that's what I do. And I got a, a lot of literature that I, I laid out here. That's a, that's a recent catalog. Yeah, I got some of those, too. These are the there. Uh, here's a magazine out of Canada that just came out. I was featuring a prison zine. A picture of me and Miggs, who's now one of the NATO Five in here. They talk about the work we do. I mean, prisoner support groups around the world, in this country, prisoners, a lot of prisoners, articulate prisoners, known uh, political prisoners, they understand what I'm doing and, and the importance of, of this kind of activity. Uh, more and more other people are learning how important it is uh, and accessing it. We're building a new uh, ABC chapters all the time all over the, that are doing this kind of work. My entire collection, which is uh, over 700 publications, is uh, housed at, in DePaul. Uh, they have all, all the hard copies and they they help. They, uh, they allow people to get 20 pages of whatever the index cross-reference extensive index is on their website so people can order from them but they can always just just write me and uh, I'm gonna put a new catalog together in the next few days and uh, I'm, I'm working on all kinds of fantastic new things uh, the last thing I did a few days ago I wrote uh, a sort of a, a history of uh, the struggle against the Crete Detention Center, which I was fundamentally involved with. So I wrote a zine about that. Um, there was a lady, art professor from New York. She came, she was invited to teach a semester at Northwestern, and her whole semester was focusing on the Crete Detention Center fight, which was kind of interesting. So, uh, and we got people together who did all this, and. and march from Little Village to Crete, the three-day march we did, and, and all the all the other things we did. Um, she, she made some an art project of it, which is kind of nice. So I, I figured I'd come to her art showing and I'd bring a, you know, I'd write a, a story about what, what my participation was, basically. I talked about other, other the whole thing, and just, but it, there was so many things going on so quick, and so many people involved. Uh, I just sort of touched on things. But yeah, that's what I do, and uh, the, as you can tell, the response has been amazing. Uh, there's, there's history to, to doing this kind of work. There's three people I'd like to mention. First one, of course, is Leo Tolstoy, which people know was basically the world's most renowned novelist. Tolstoy said, I started my social activity with the school and teaching after 40 years, I'm more convinced that only by education, free education, can we ever rid ourselves of the existing horrible order of things and to replace it with a rational organization. The great educator anarchist Emma Goldman said of him, he believed that whatever part heredity may play, there are other factors equally great, if not greater, that may and will eradicate or minimize the so-called first cause. 
proper economic and social environment, the breath and freedom of nature, healthy exercise, love and sympathy, and above all, a deep understanding for the needs of the child. These would destroy the cruel and unjust and criminal stigma imposed on the ignorant child. Tolstoy favored an unconscious education, a natural process in which children are not even aware that they are being educated. He taught that all aspects of education should be directed toward the pupil's emancipation. <coughs> Another one was the Francisco Ferrer, who was a Spanish anarchist exiled to, to France. He started the modern school movement. An appreciative French woman bequeathed him his inheritance so he could continue his work. When he was able to move back to Spain, the schools rapidly spread throughout Spain. He was shot to death by the government at Montju's prison in 1909. His final words to the firing squad were, Aim well, my friends. You are not responsible. I am innocent. Long live the modern school. And here's a quote from him talking about what, why he was doing what he was doing. Rulers have always taken care to control the education of the people. They know better than anyone else that their power is based almost entirely on the school and that they therefore insist on retaining their monopoly on it. The true function of a teacher is to encourage self-learning to allow each child to develop in his or her own way rather than force a predetermined program of study on them. Yeah, we can't have uh, real human beings. We gotta have robots that will acquiesce to what the government and the monopoly and capitalists tell them to. And the third man, Paulo Freire, was a brilliant, brilliant Brazilian. The seminal book, uh, *Pedagogy of the, of the Oppressed*, came out in 1970. He wrote, "True generosity consists precisely in fighting to destroy the causes which nourish." false charity. False charity constrains the fearful and subdued the rejects of life to extend their trembling hands. True, ge true generosity lies in striving so that these hands, whether of individuals or entire peoples, need to be extended less and less in supplication so that more and more they become human hands which work and working transform the world. This lesson in apprenticeship must come, however, from the oppressed themselves and from those in solidarity with them. As individuals or as peoples, by fighting for the restoration of their humanity, they will be attempting the restoration of true generosity. Who are better prepared than the oppressed to understand the terrible significance of an oppressive society? Who suffer the effects of oppression more than the oppressed? Who can better understand the necessity of liberation? They will not gain this liberation by chance but through the practice of their quest for it, through their recognition of the necessity to fight for it. And this fight, because of the purpose given it by the oppressed, will actually constitute an act of love opposing the lovelessness which lies at the heart of the oppressor's violence, even when clothed in false generosity. His name, Paulo Freire. The book was Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Yeah, F R I E or F R E I R E. What's that? What's that? What's that? It's a terrific book. I'm going to give you a couple of bonus quotes. Here's Max Stirner, <coughs> long in the tooth anarchist. An education for freedom, not for subservience. The real purpose of education is to produce not useful citizens, but free men, autonomous, independent, and self sufficient. And of course, Mikhail Bakunin, who wrote, Education must be founded wholly upon the scientific development of reason and not upon faith, upon the development of personal dignity and independence, not upon piety and obedience, upon the cult of truth and justice at any cost, and above all, upon respect for humanity. He also said, Children belong neither to their parents nor to society. They belong to themselves and their future liberty. Peter Kropotkin, the sterility of conventional education produces superficiality, parrot-like repetition, slavishness, and inertia of mind. 
So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to help people realize their own humanity, tap into that that person that they, they know is in there somewhere. A lot of times it just takes a little bit of, of, of love and let them actually feeling that someone actually gives a damn about their life for the first time perhaps in their entire life. And so I write a million letters too. I develop a million personal relationships and I, and I try to help prisoners once they come out all kinds of ways. It's, it's an endless battle. It's an unbelievable need for this kind of help and this, this work. And like, like the guy said earlier, very few are willing to do this. So, but I, I find it unbelievably fulfilling. When I first started out, that's what I was looking for. I was looking for, for other writers, other thinkers. And that's what I found. I, I have some wonderful, wonderful collaborators. Unfortunately, 95% of them are in prison. So, and, and like I said, this, this work is constantly being interrupted, mostly on the prisoners' end, so that they can abuse them further and try to shut them up, which, of course, never works. But also, the, the raiding uh, anarchist info shops out west, they've done it in this city. I haven't been raided. I'm just kind of surprised I haven't been raided. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very open about everything. I'm, I'm Joe Normo. I got a wife, two kids, a house, a, a job, a car. I live in the suburbs. Everyone in the community knows me as this excellent grassroots organizer that gives a damn about them, too. Because I do. I, I care about all people. But I'll tell you, I think the char starving child, the girl on the Horn of Africa, starving to death in a refugee camp, her life is just as important as a smiling assassin in the White House. That's what people need to learn to have. Empathy for every last human being on this earth. Every life form. Because the whole life of earth itself is, is extremely threatened and, and continue to be and, and, you know, these horrible uh, tsunamis and, and other natural tragedies are only going to increase. And our only chance is to realize that government and coercive power is killing all of us. And really, what, what good does it do that a billionaire becomes a ten billionaire? What's the point of that? While well, everyone else dies off and suffers and scrounges to make a living. I refuse to accept it. So, thanks a lot. All right. All right. Are we ready for questions? Oh, sure. All right. All right. I uh, see that Bob has been sitting on a question. Okay. My hand was raised first. Are there any other countries that have porous borders where people can just come and go freely at will, like you seem to want us to have here? I don't really know. Uh, I suppose some do. Some are. I mean, there's places all over the world that are sparsely populated. There's, there's minimal uh, uh, government, so people do go there and go in and out. But a lot of it has to do with, uh, you know, poverty. I mean, people who are poor don't fly and they can't zip around and do this or go wherever they want. Uh, people. Migrating people are basically driven by desperation, whether it's war, or famine, or poverty, or whatever, or a combination. Usually they flock to the, the shanty towns of the big cities, but when there's no work there either, what are they going to do? They, and you know, like I said, a lot of their their relatives and their their history, like they call Southwest, uh, we call the Southwest, they call Aslan. That, that used to be their half, northern half of their country in Mexico. So they, a lot of these people have decades-long history here too. And uh, you know, I, I don't. Whatever their laws are in other countries, if they're restrictive, they're wrong. Are there any laws useless? Really? Does it stop any from anybody from doing anything? No. Does it punish people? But that's just punishing people. You know. Like a, a like an abusive father, it hurts a, his children. Well, I'm going to punish you. It doesn't solve a damn thing. Okay. All right. Can you uh, just give us a little bit about your background, since this is going on on the internet? Can you give us your website or your? Uh... Well, I don't have a website. 
Uh, presidents don't have access to the internet. That's another way they deny them any kind of education or, or con connectivity to the outside world. Uh, years ago, I had a website, but it was crashed, and when NBCI.com took over those free websites. But I don't mess with websites because I direct, deal directly with prisoners, uh, and also a lot of the websites have been hacked into by the government and monitored, and sometimes used to to set people up with, and you know, find out what. I, I don't. I'm not that fond of the internet or websites. You, you don't. Personally. You, you don't use listservs or e no, email. No, not or personally. But, uh, you know, sometimes I, I I was part of the Anarchist Black Cross Network for five years. I helped get that started. But I, I stopped being a part of it. I'm, I'm independent. I do make announcements on listservs, of course, and, and of various sorts, you know. So, because this. You could. Uh, I've, I've been very insanely busy. I work full time. You know, like I say, I got a wife, kids, They're doing this insane amount of work. So I don't have time to really, I never learned how to, I never took a course in computer, I just wrote my, I do, I write with it, I, could, I use email, but I just zip through it, I don't spend much time with it. Because a lot of it is just thought thinking and, and writing, you know, it's a lot of uh, transcribing and editing uh, and crafting into publications and mix it in with our work and do all this kind of stuff. It doesn't really translate into needing the internet. I mean, everyone seems to need the internet. And, I don't need any of that. I don't need a, a cell phone I hardly use. I don't need that. I work with ideas, paper and pencil, through the, the mail, basically. There might be, you could Google me, I'm sure you find a million things about it. Uh, like I said, the DePaul has all my stuff and they have websites. There are ABC websites, and sometimes um, during these uh, censorship cases where they're censoring uh, our publications and the prisoners bring it up to a court case, you know, and I have to do uh, depositions or whatever, affidavits about it. Some of the reasons why they claim that this material is uh, hurtful or gang related or violent, whatever, is because of what they got off some other website, some anonymous ABC written material that I had nothing to do with. So, you know, it could be, the, the, I'm sure that there's some of my essays or whatnot are on the internet somewhere, but like I said, I really don't pay much attention to any of that. If somebody was to get a hold of you, how would they be able to reach you? Well, they could email me at anthonyrayson at hotmail.com. They could call me on the telephone. My home phone number is 708-534-1334. Or most, what most people do, the prisoners especially, is just write me. South Chicago ABC Zine Distro, PO Box 721, Homewood, Illinois, 60430. Thank you. Sure most of your literature this is just a, a drop in the bucket. Like I say, I have 700 different titles. Can you Maybe show some of them for the dozen. camera real quick? Just hold a few up. Here's the one I just completed called The Sweet Defeat of the Prison in Crete. <laughs> huh. Here's an interesting one. I'm going to read a little bit about it later when I get another chance. It's called Conflicts of Interest, No Warning Shots. It's like a, a prisoner rap, uh, you know, poet. Here's what I did for a, uh, a workshop I did called Brutal Truth Zines, The Final Taboo, Educating America's Enslaved. So that kind of goes over what I'm talking about today. This is a brilliant essay. But actually, I had to, he didn't have a title for it, so he just gave it a title. And after reading it, this, this is the only thing that made sense. Neocolonialism drives American social pathology. Here's one from a, a black African anarchist in prison in Georgia. And look what fascism has wrought. Where have all the humans gone? This is a terrific economic analysis. Zine out of uh, Minneapolis. This guy's not a prisoner, but it's called Show Me the Money. Brilliant anarchist, economist. Um, here's a cool one. The DePaul librarian came down and interviewed me for her like master's thesis for library science. So this is my interview with her. I do a lot of interviews. Uh, here's my own personal zine called Thought Bombs. This is number 31. And it's got tons of stuff in it about uh, mostly about my uh, my uh, grassroots activism, 
Uh, last fall I did another uh, crop circle in a hay field and then I organized a uh, harvest fest down there in a big farm down in the Puyatone Airport footprint. But like I say, this is just a little, you know, a snippet of stuff and a whole box of other stuff. Or here's an interesting uh, interview I did with uh, Russell Maroon Schultz. Now he's a well-known uh, political prisoner. He was a Black Liberation Army uh, fighter back in the day. He'd been in prison like 30 years. But I interviewed him and then, then it was put together with another interview earlier done, plus three of his essays. So it's a real comprehensive look at his thinking. He's a real brilliant thinker. So that's the kind of stuff I do. Uh, here I, I asked a couple of prisoners to uh, come up with contributions for this presentation. And this is what one of them came up with. So zines are our real, real weapons. And another guy, another prisoner, his essay is entitled Educate to Liberate, Prison Strike. He thinks that's the Achilles heel. That if prisons strike, the, the prisons will come to a halt because without prison labor to run the prisons, not just prison labor to make money for corporations, the prisons couldn't function. Oh yeah, that's just, but I also have stuff on, on all kinds of history and uh, feminism, uh, transgender prisoners, uh, Native American prisoners, Chicano prisoners, all kinds of things, psychology, history, political analysis, uh, a lot of legal zines to explain what prisoners have all gone through the labyrinthian process of trying to challenge their cases on different, using case law and all this stuff that other prisoners have written for them, like Handbook for the Wrongfully Convicted, uh, all these kinds of things, uh, and health health issues, because uh, the food that, and the medical treatment is just abominable in there. So there's, there's a million issues that we try to cover as many as we can, and basically I take my cue from what they're asking for that I don't have, that, that they seem to okay. want. Uh, Bernie? Yes. Uh you mentioned briefly Anita Alvarez, and uh, in light of the events of the past week or so, including the uh, indictment of Rich Vineco, could you expand on that a little bit? What about Anita Alvarez? Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I sort of like to go to the 60 Minutes interview where she she tried to say an exonerated rapist who was in prison for like 15 years that. Well, we can't not let him go because, yeah, there's there's semen from this other guy that was in prison and died or something. That, but maybe he he it was necrophilia that you know he came upon her dead body after this other guy that they cursed. Some insane kind of thing. This is the kind of stretch that they stretch for for cops too to to get them off of any kind of problem. You know the yeah. the, the opposite direction. You know. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, Anita Alvarez is, is really a bulldog on this. And actually, I have a zine about that mentions her, put out by Crime Think about how their the FBI strategy nowadays is entrapping fringe people on, on the you know on the on the uh, activist movement like the the NATO Six, like the Cleveland Five, or the NATO Five and the Cleveland Five, where they get a FBI plant in there who's egging them on to, to do some kind of weird bombing and then he comes up with all the bombs and he comes up with all the money, you know? And he just sort of get, tags these guys along, gets a wire, and then they say something stupid, all of a sudden, bang, they're, they're arrested. That's what Anita Alvarez is, is spearheading. Yeah, and also the, the Vineco thing where she kept trying to deny the, the, any kind of cooperation or cough up any of the papers and, and still claim that she's doing everything legitimate, whatever you know. Everyone knows she's trying to stonewall this case. Gene Anderson? Uh, I've been referring to myself as an anarchy for over 40 years. I want you to give me your definition of an anarchist. Of an anarchist? Well, uh, no bosses, no gods. <laughs> Pretty simple. Respect for human beings, golden rule, treat other people like you would want to be treated. Don't stand for for bullying or, or 
or liars. I got an essay I wrote called Don't Believe Liars and Murderers. Uh, look at things square in the face. Stand up for what's right. Speak out. Be proactive. And do do what you can, the best you can. I mean, yeah, the, the goal is a, is a decent society where people are treated fairly and, and, and people are allowed to to uh, develop their talents and interests in a, a sustainable society. That's the goal of a lot of things. Christianity, well, they, they want to like a, a cloud thing where the heaven and whatnot. But, yeah, a lot of, it's, it's like, it's kind of like a religion based on reality and realism. You know, I'm doing this because it's the right thing to do. And that, you know, that's what I think motivates a lot of anarchists. Of course, you know, there's a, every, every kind of stripe of anarchist you can imagine. Personally, I, I like to consider myself a Haymarket anarchist. I thought their example was fantastic. They, they really uh, spearheaded the whole eight-hour movement, the whole country, uh, and they, they did a lot of publishing and, and agitating and, and educating and, and getting people together to, to empower each other. Well, that, that's kind of what I like to pattern myself on. Okay, uh, I so, uh, I, I'm not so clear about the free education. Um, the first question is, so does the education uh, include distribution of those zines among the prisoners and do they let them have it? But the second one is, I wonder, you, you couldn't be part of the DOC, Department of Correction, uh, you're an anarchist. So um, if you send a thousand letters a month, that would co cost you at least like $480 a month. I mean, all the zines, all the printing, where does the money come from? It comes out of my own pocket. I have a living wage job, as does my wife. We live in a little two-bedroom house that's paid for. We live frugally. We entertain ourselves. We cut a, I don't have cable TV. I don't have a lot of stuff. We don't go to the movies and all this garbage. A lot of people. We entertain ourselves, you know. We write, we think, we play Scrabble, we talk, we live, you know. We don't watch TV like people. So I have this, this money I can use, and I do use it. And uh, as for the distribution, uh, I, I'm resourceful. I bundle print jobs, so at least I have like 10,000 sheets impressions to get the cheapest rate, and then tack on like 25% off, and, you know, whatever, to get it as cheap as possible. I'll do all the work myself, all the stapling and all that, and collating and everything. Uh, yeah, mailing is expensive. We ask, we ask for donations. Sometimes we get some. Some, most of the time we don't. Uh, I'm going to retire from my job at the end of the month, so I won't have that twenty thousand dollars a year that I've been spending. So I'm going to have to put the squeeze on people. I've built up a lot of goodwill. I'm going to say, hey, you guys got to help me. I'm going to have to find out where I can print things for free, access like uh, college. Uh, student groups, radical student groups that are, are like agreeable to let me print stuff, stuff like this. I got to use. I have to work work on that. I'll, uh, it's been easy. All I have to do is shell out money. You know, because twenty thousand. Twenty thousand a year I've been spending. Yeah. Cause this is my contribution to the struggle, and also the the publications are specifically not priced. There's no, there's no price tag on any of them. We encourage, the, we call it anti-copyright. We encourage people to reprint anything and everything they want. The prisoners have their own distribution network. A lot of times what they do is they unravel towels, so a long string, like kite string, and they set up these little pulley systems through the, the different, even the tiers, different floors, and they put the, the zines on and they, it's like a laundry that they move along. And they, they, they pass them all through the prison. Many, many people read just one publication. Usually when it stops is because it's confiscated as contraband. After it's already been allowed in. All right. Uh, Tom Shepard. You mentioned the NATO five a number of times. And uh, does that include those young guys that were 
kind of uh, framed over there in Bridgeport. Uh, yeah, those three, and then two other guys. The, the, the guy I, I wrote the, the Polish the national with a, with a, was going to put a bomb in a Harry Potter book. Oh boy, let's all dive under our, our desk. Okay, so my question is, have you had any communication with any of those guys? Yes, one of them was a collaborator of mine who I helped start Northwest ABC with. His name is uh, Mark Neweem. Is, is I visited him several times at Cook County. They've been beating him. They harass him on a daily basis. Uh, they're treating him unmercifully in there. They're still being held and... Oh yeah, they're still... No, people no in, bond? in Cook County, they're there for months and months, sometimes years, before their case comes to court. <coughs> and even if they get acquitted, okay, too bad, you've been in prison 18 months, doesn't matter, nothing. It's sick what goes on in there. It's really a depraved place, like all of them are. West King? Uh, yeah. Have you heard of a lady named Tammy Pepper that's connected with uh, the Sesta QV Act? It's connected with the burning of London. And when that occurred, all the records of London were burnt up. It was connected with the Pope, the King of England, and the mayor of London. When did this happen? In 1666. You can do the, you can do the research. And that has affected all of what people go through. And it's based on them saying that everybody is dead. There's nobody alive. Everybody's lost at sea. Okay. And you have to come before a judge, not a magistrate, and say that you are alive and you did test the authorities. Now, once you do that, you're no longer a prisoner of war based on 1929. And no one is supposed to be able to arrest you or take your freedoms away. This is something that Tammy Pepper okay. puts into play. I haven't heard that, but I, I have heard uh, that legally, prison, prisoners, once you're convicted of a crime, the legal system considers you as if you are dead. There's a, there's a legal term for it, mortis or something. And all your possessions are, are not yours anymore. Nothing is yours anymore. You're, you're not you're not a person anymore. And by the 14th Amendment, or the 13th Amendment, they're still legal slaves. And there was a court case that I, I was part of that the Missouri Prison Labor Union took all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court and says, we're being treated like slave labor. We're forced to go clean up these toxic dumps, these, these problems with like train crashes and all this fumes are, are coming out or are doing all the dangerous work other workers don't want to do. It's too dangerous to do. They force prisoners to do and work to, you know, dawn till dusk in the, in the fields. And they say, we're being treated like slaves in the, in the august, you know, whatever they're wearing, their, 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 their nightgown wears that we're supposed to worship. They, they look in the Constitution and say, well, by the 13th Amendment, I'm afraid you are a legal slave, so they can treat you this way. I'll get in contact with you and, and turn you on to this young lady. Yeah, that's an interesting tag because she's a lot of what the, she's using a lot of the American and what justice happens, system is what happens from the British. When she goes to court and she wins the case in court, then the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury makes it so that the uh, uh, people that are connected with the case within 90 days, they, they, they are set for treason. And the penalty for treason is death. There's a lot of, uh, you know, things that you would think you could bring up in court, but it's always a whitewash thing. And basically, the, the, the judge and the prosecutor are in cahoots and they tell the jury what to do if there is a jury. 90-95% of cases are, are plea bargain in a judge's chamber anyway. So, it's, it's basically a prosecutor's game these days. Yeah, you uh, mentioned Peter. prison industries. Uh, what do prisoners produce in the USA? Is there anything that I might have that's been made by a prisoner? Yeah, probably. They, they, uh, they do a lot of like... Well, they, in the South they do a lot of farming, actually. There's still the plantations, they're now prison plantations. They were slave plantations. But they, they, they make clothing, they do all, they make, uh, uh, manufacture all kinds of different things. Uh, a lot of them are like telephone operators for airlines. But actually they're incredibly underused. 
as workers. There's certain workers that, that make sure that the prison themselves function, but most of their time is wasted. It's absolutely wasted. Intellectual time, nothing. There's nothing for them to study or think about. It's just They just are forced to sit in their cell a lot or just sit and stare at TV all the time. So they're, they're their, their real labor could be immensely more productive. But what little labor they do, they get a pittance for, and some company is making a profit for it. If it's, if it's privately contracted out, they, they only have to pay them at the most $5 an hour, and sometimes 20 cents, and in some states, nothing. In Texas and other states, they pay them nothing. Well, what's the name of that 17-year-old that was killed by a broken car? His name was Dylan Drapeau. Mm -hmm. Dylan Drapeau, D-R-A-P-E. A.U. And we know, you know, he was like a son to me. My, he slept over at our house, and my son was there. They were going to play music together. My son's a very talented musician himself, but this kid was just an unbelievably talented kid. And to have him murdered like that on roadkill, and then see all this whole thing unfold, the same garbage that goes on in the city is, you know, the, the suburban police departments look up to the city, oh, well, we'll just follow what they're doing, you know. It's just nauseating beyond belief. Bernie, did you get your question in? Oh, yeah. All right. Frank had one, I uh, think. Russell, how would you describe the difference between the anarchist and the libertarian? I would say that uh, they both love liberty and freedom. They both hate government. But the libertarians, they want to be able to be capitalists. They want to be able to enslave other people. So, anarchists aren't like that. They want to enslave people. They believe in capitalism, anarchists don't. They believe in government. They believe in government. They just don't like to be hassled by government. They don't mind if it hassles other people, though. We don't believe in government. Well, good. We shouldn't. Horrible. Yes, Charles. Yeah, you you mentioned all rights are natural rights, and I, especially at the college, I've heard people say, "Well, I have a right to this and a right to that." And my understanding is the only rights you have are the rights that are defined by law, and you don't recognize rights being defined by law. I mean, no. What are these other rights? Where, where are you they? can do whatever you want as long as you don't infringe on somebody else. That's, that's pretty simple. It's pretty, pretty, and if you do, something, something should be intervened to stop you from doing that. Who? Who? Those defect, affected by your actions. Yeah, but who, who should stop you from intervening? Well, the, the, the society that you're in. Look at, look, at, look, at what Native America, right, look at some examples. Say you're in a, in a tribe, okay? And you do something stupid or rotten to somebody. Well, they're going to decide what your punishment is going to be, whether you're going to be maybe exiled from the group, or you're going to be denied something or this, or you, maybe you have to go through some kind of rehabilitation, or, or uh, you have to, uh, what, what do you call it? You got to pay him back somehow. You want the, the goal is to, to to help him find his humanity and be a human being again, so he can rejoin the group. Because really, you don't want to just shove someone away. You know, put him in a box and, and make him turn him into an animal. Let me, let me have a follow up. You, you talk about prisoner rights. Where do you base these rights in? I mean, where are they, well, they're human where beings they, too. Where are they derived from? Well, like anybody else, they're human beings. A lot of people in prison, well, none of them should really be there. It doesn't do anybody any good. There are people that are dangerous and, and can't be allowed to be around other people because they will, they're, they're ruined. They're, you ruin human beings and they will attack you if they get a chance. I understand that. And a lot of people are sick in the head and have horrible ideas and will do terrible things to you. And a lot of them are in prison. But a lot of them then also run governments or corporations or police departments or whatever too. Those people aren't considered criminal. Their crimes aren't, aren't considered crimes. The macro crimes, the, the trillion dollars of theft is not a crime. But if a kid sticks up a 7-Eleven, that's a crime. Well, that, that, that's a just 
dysfunctional way of looking at things. Yes, yeah, um, maybe you could uh, <coughs> talk about the militarization, militarization of the police. The yeah, they're armed uh, like soldiers. Yeah, it's really sick. So machine guns and all this. Sort well, of thing. yeah, it, it, it comes. Well, he could just elaborate on that. Well, so. now you see, you know, these these horrible when they basically arrest somebody who is unruly at all, they're going to tase them, if not beat them or shoot them. I mean, they, they, they're they killing people right and left all over the country at an alarming rate. It's horrible. Like just yesterday, they tased this guy to death. This guy is a, a graduate of the Western. I mean, they should you should never call the cops if there's a domestic disturbance because the cops could very well kill your loved one and you'll have regret for the rest of your life. They do have all these assault weapons. They do have these modern technologies, tasers and high-powered rifles and vehicles and, and computers. And that does come from the military. A lot of the people that, that come back from, from Afghanistan or Iraq after killing people over there, they're hired as police. They're hired as guards. They're hired in schools. So yeah, they're, they're militarizing everything. And they, the, the whole blame, well, this crazy person went off and killed a bunch of people. Though What a horrible tragedy it was. It was a horrible thing. But what's going to be the ramification of that? The schools are going to start being locked down. They're going to take it out on the children. There's going to be police with guns. They're going to frisk these kids. They're going to really, you know, it's not going to turn into a good situation. You know, you, police tactics, police state, that's the definition of what Nazi Germany was all about. That's the way we're going, though. That's the way we're going. You see a guy pulled over for speeding, all of a sudden there's four or five cops. It's, it's madness. I mean, there's way too many cops than there should be. Clinton dealt, you know, put 100,000 cops on the streets. What, what, what was the result of that? He put 800,000 more people in prison because of it. For what? Minor crimes, basically. Dope possession, small sales of dope. It's, it's outrageous. And if a cop shoots someone, well, uh, we'll, we'll investigate. The police portal. Yeah, right. Come on. I think somebody like Jerry Sandusky belongs in prison. I don't think prison does anybody any good or society any good. Now, he is a despicable human being like a lot of these people are, you know. I don't think he should be allowed to run children. I think he should be somehow severely punished. I don't know how. I think the people, the families of those people that he abused should decide his punishment. They may want to string him up. I wouldn't even, that wouldn't bother me if that was a, their decision. I mean, I, I wouldn't agree with it, but I still think feel they have the right to make that decision, what? not some self-glorying, self you know, court that thinks that they're so, uh, you know, righteous garbage while they're, while they're funneling all these young black kids into prison like an assembly line. So you're basically saying where you have a situation where persons are aggrieved, they make their own laws. If they choose to string somebody up, they can do this. Well, they're going to do it anyway, if they get a chance. I mean. You can't tell people what, you can try to reason with them or give them, you know, humanist education, give them a, a, alternatives, but, when you, think you know, if, if, if somebody was killing somebody or abusing somebody, and those, the people, just, you know, sometimes it happens in the city that, like, a car, car, a drunk will kill somebody, they'll tear the guy out. And, Right. Take them out right there. And I don't agree with it, but I think it's still better than having a cop deal with it and throwing them in prison forever and then spitting them out again to redo the same thing over. You know, Jerry Sandusky will never get out of prison. No, I know a lot of people won't. But he he did a lot of serious criminal things, and a lot of people that are, are have life terms didn't. They're like three strike victims. You know, like they they committed a crime the third time. Oh, now you get a life sentence. That's insane. If you like steal a candy bar from a Seven Eleven or something. Ken Friends, how would you, under these circumstances, how would you handle sophisticated organized crime? Well, you can't really handle it until you have a society that, that, that thinks rationally and, and people's minds function legitimately, you know, that are educated properly, put it that way. In this situation, it's just a hypothetical, non-real thing that won't happen. I'm not going to make any decision. 
But organized crime, you mean government? That's what that is. That's all that is. Like the mafia? Like well, I don't know. Maybe they wouldn't even want to if they weren't imposing their will on, on them. Well, they're going to go after your money too somehow. Well, if that's the case, the people that realize that there's a problem are the ones that are going to have to spearhead the effort to deal with it. You know, uh, anarchist uh, collectives or communes or, or historically, they've, they've drawn from their people like militias to deal with stuff like this. What are you gonna do with these guys? This guy's this guy's trying to he's he's uh, you know he's running a, a factory, he's enslaving these workers. What are we gonna do with this guy? Well, they're gonna probably <laughs> educate those people to help them stop him from doing that, one way or another. In cities of more than a million people, how do you get these groups? Well you, <laughs> it gets to it like a breaking point, a few hundred or a thousand, I don't know what it would be, where people can actually uh, function as a, a anarchist commune, say, where the decisions are made through consensus and everyone has a genuine stake in what actually goes on and how things are decided and what, what, what the group does. But you can federate with other groups similarly doing the same thing. Uh, you could draw representatives from all those groups to, to deal with macro problems like city transportation or whatever. I mean, there's people that have the, the, the capability of doing this. You don't have to go through the, the vetting process of the political, you know, and, and be appointed to some position and then start lording over an authoritatively telling all the underlings what the policy is and what they're going to do, and even though it has no real relation to how the transportation needs, for example, of the citizens, how that they, they come into play and work, you know, as one. It's got to come from a the ground up, the, the, the neighborhood up, you know, and that's where, you know, from there you have a, you get, like in, during Spain, when they had a revolution in Spain, they had a lot of communities that were anarchist organized, but they had, like, national conferences where they'd send a representative, and they'd make decisions that were, were more, covered more ground or, or dealt with bigger problems or whatever, you know, of course they were constantly, I was just sieged by Franco and Hitler. It's kind of difficult to to organize under those you know insane conditions, but there there is a way, and uh, it's been shown to be uh, you know effective way for people to live their lives. And there have been communal type of arrangements uh, in Africa, in Native America, before government became prominent, when when early men and women were were developing into Homo sapiens sapiens. They had, they had arrangements where they, they lived communally and, and basically lived an anarchist type of, of life. Where, you know, they, so that, that's the idea. It's not like we're, we're you know, immune to realizing what's going on and how things function and how we got to deal with things to have things happen. You know, I'm not fond of bogging myself down in all the legalese or the, the, the system. But sometimes you have to, to help people. Anything that helps alleviate suffering is positive, in my opinion. So, so any little su lessening of suffering is a good thing to, to uh, you know, concern yourself with and help with. And that's what I try to do as much as I can. Of course, it's, it's frustrating because you can only help on small things. In the meantime, the guy's still sitting in a damn cage or whatever. Or, you know... The neighborhood's still being boarded up. It's foreclosed, and it's, you know, there's nothing there. There's no, you know, so is it, you can't really affect important, necessary changes on such a small scale until people are are upset enough to finally learn the truth about what's going on themselves and get involved, and to the point where they're affected. Okay, what's well, King? Do you realize that you? use words that are very powerful, like prisoner, uh, if you could use a word that's neutral, or like everyone's a soul, or, you see what I'm getting at, instead of blanket, you go out and you have these meetings and you're constantly saying prisoner, 
you're blessing these people with a negative. Now, if you use the word that was neutral or that would uplift the spirit, then that would be something. That's a good point, but it's what they are. They're, they're treated as prisoners. Like, but that's, that's if you accept instead of something divine. If you accept that. But if you don't accept it, then they're not Christmas. They're not well, under the 13th Amendment. They're not, because if you say everybody has a right, then that's what you go by. That right. Right. Well, not, by, not by somebody they, else's judgment. They don't like to be called inmates. Well, I'm They'd not, rather be called a prisoner. But you, you probably have a point it has a negative connotation, but you can say that about anything. Gang, anarchist. That's the point. That's the you point. Know, the Holy even Spirit, even, even radio, grassroots or? organizer or whatever, you know? Uh, Dave Zucker. Yes, you spoke of it being tough to deal with people like Hitler and Franco. When people in those kind of countries get started, how are the, you propose that we in this country stop them? <laughs> what do you mean, like in where? What are you talking about now? No, I'm talking about them. How do we stop them? Yes. Well, you don't collaborate economically and, and uh, like like uh, Ford did with them. You don't treat them like a, a little wonderful little uh, capitalist hero. Oh, look, he, he took took out unemployment. Uh, he uh, he's getting people working. He's, he's making the Volkswagen Beetle. Well, this is great. This is cool. That's what a big section of capitalism, American and British capitalism, thought about him. They thought, well, he's kind of a wild. They, they didn't care that he was screaming bloody murder for Jews. They didn't care about that. And even when he was murdering all the Jews, we didn't care about them. We wouldn't let them come to this country. Right, so how would we care about them? Well, not through the U.S. government, that's for sure. Human beings, NCOs, that's what, ha that's what we do. That's the positive thing. Uh, Doctors Without Borders, uh, people that actually give a damn about other people to go and try to help them build wells or help them... Uh, Grow food. What do you want? To, want to subvert their their uh, their government? Well, it probably deserves it. I'm sure it does. But doesn't ours? Should we be worried about our own government? How to get rid of our own horrible government? I mean, that's their kind of problem, really. It's not really ours. Our problem is right here in this country. And basically, we have the biggest job of all because this country got the th thumb and the boot on every every country in the world, really. Every human being in the world. Every second of every day we threaten the world with mass extermination. If we don't like it enough, we're going to unleash nuclear weapons, which we've already done on several occasions. So yeah, we got to worry about our own government before we worry about Nazis in another country, which we probably trained. Oh, so we, we don't care about them Jews? Of course we do. Of course we do. Why, sh why shouldn't we? They're human beings too. But we didn't. Back in the day, back during the 30s and 40s, we sure didn't, as a government. As a form of government, is there any country in the world right now that you would consider a model of good governance? Well, I mean, some are better than others, of course. Some are less uh, threatening and have less weapons and less cops, and they're more benign in their laws. And you know, they don't throw people in prison at the incredible pace that we do and the, the, the lengthy sentences. Scandinavia is probably better than most. I mean, I don't really know. I don't I don't go around and study in all, uh, all the governments of the world. I just detest the whole idea of government, basically, and, and deal with real problems that I deal, you know see in my near vicinity and in this country, basically. And, of course, the whole... Mess. And as a follow-up to the question, are you familiar with the work of Gene Sharp? Uh, he's a human rights activist, anarchist out of Boston, Massachusetts, and he wrote a book called uh, How T From Dictatorship to Democracy. Are you familiar with his work? No, I'm not. You should be. Okay. What's his name again? Gene Sharp. I'll give you the information okay. after the talk. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of brilliant people out there I wish I, I knew about and had their books and stuff like that, too. It's available for free, free download. Oh, good, yeah. I do have a question. That is about Mondragon. Right. Uh, That's a wonderful project. 
Yes, well, would you care to describe it for uh, people who may not have heard about it? Uh, it's a, it's, what? It is a I'm really not terribly familiar with it. It's a it's a uh, anarchist driven uh, enterprise in, in Spain where it is collectively run by the workers and the, you know basically along anarchist principles and it's very functional but I'm not really too familiar with the specifics of it I, I'm, I'm just learning about it myself now like I say I've been kind of uh, Blandered into this whole prison thing because this I see the prison as like Cajun shrimp ground zero in the struggle here at home. All right, let's go. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Okay. Last question, Cubs or Sox fan? Uh, Ooh. Right. So you do so you do agree with Obama on something? Cajun shrimp. Cajun shrimp. Stick around. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Rebuttals. Okay. How many people have? Have one more question. You're right. Hello. Well, you for your next week. Your rebuttal. One, two, three, four, five. Thank you. Five. Would you like us? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Probably. Yeah, good. Thanks. All right. I know there's a lot of good, good thinking going on out there. Six minutes each. <laughs> Up to six minutes. Oh, who's keeping the time? You. You. No, I'm not. My man. You're the boss. You're the boss. I uh, got a stopwatch. I'm, uh, I'll try to do my best to keep time. Hang on here. Go ahead, Frank. This, may, this system is a mess, granted. But the explanation of the speaker do not rise to the level of recent policy. It is no explanation whatsoever. It's not a functioning thing. So just to say that we should change it and not knowing at all how it will function in a group of 100 people, this idea that the community could punish somebody, that's fine. But in this, in this world economy, in this world complexity, that is not a problem. Uh, David, uh, I really uh, thought you as a reasonable, good person, but Dresden, come work. Dresden, okay, Humber, okay, Tokyo, okay. Um, at this point, I, 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 will, I will now put you in my list of sheepheads. <laughs> From now on, that's how I will look at you. In, in, uh, in today, today, the Japanese government is allowing the people to be subject to high levels of radiation and use the people's money to save the company who produced the accident. So, uh, Fukushima, it's okay to bomb it, bomb Tokyo, we did. So, what the heck are you, uh, what kind of human being are you that uh, you, you satisfy yourself with your hate to allow people who are children and women and all that to be incinerated by by another government it really bothers me to no end to your your so um i i um i um not mention noam chomsky because he was it, it turns out that it's very relevant his his uh his conference, and uh, you can listen in YouTube, uh, education for what and for whom. It is really in-depth an analysis of what the, the policies that we are living on today and how they are being implemented and how people are turning to uh, uh, accepting uh, sheep, not, not questioning and not rebelling against it. Um, 
so uh, I don't know how much I know that we have jails for profit schools for profit hospitals for profit water systems for profit roads for profit religion for profit mm -hmm. this is a mess guys uh, we, we don't have no limit to the amount of uh, uh, destruction that we tolerate for another buck. Uh, we criticize the uh, people who commit crimes. We have this dysfunctional society, but the example, when you go to work and you see your corporation doing what they do it with no limit to the damage on the health or or the, or the environment, or the fish, or the water, or whatever. Uh, how do you think that the kids that are living on that environment will react when they get mad with somebody? They react violently because they have been violated over and over and over again. Now, the criminals who deal with uh, terrorists by financing or permitting them to move their monies through their bank, and the drug uh, cartels and all that, these bankers are not going to be tried. They are not going to be indicted. They are not because it's inconvenient. But a kid who steals a Coca-Cola or something in a, in a store, it will be persecuted to, to the end. Uh, this reminds, somebody mentioned Tolstoy, and you read some of the stories on Tolstoy and Dostoyevsky and all that. We are going back to the same shit. You steal a, a loaf of bread and you you throw in jail forever. It is it is not a not a good uh, society which we are living in. And uh, of course, I don't have the solution. I don't pretend to to be uh, anarchist or anything. But uh, this is not working, guys. And we have to get together to think about some humane way to solve it, not to bomb more cities to the to to dust. Uh, I know it's difficult to accept the truth, <laughs> yeah. because the truth hurts. And uh, when you're in denial, you don't want to hear nothing but that what you've been here. Now the speaker has said everything that I would say if I was privy to all of his sources. He said many things that I have already said a few times at this podium. Now, there might be some misinterpretation, misunderstanding of certain things. He only had uh, uh, 50 minutes, 60 minutes. He didn't have 60 days. And even 60 days ain't enough to tell the story about what he's talking about. Now, a government, I've been a anarchist for a long time, for over 40 years. Now, I asked him what his definition of an anarchist because Everybody, especially the guy in charge, government and society, will tell you what you are. Go fuck yourself. I know who I am. I'm an anarchist. I'm an anarchist, but I'm not the anarchist that the government going to claim or that the newspaper painted them guys over in, 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 in the west over there where Mayor Daly used to live. Bridge folk. Uh, Anarchist says one thing, and he says that from knowledge. I didn't read a lot of books, and I've been around a lot of fucking years. But government ain't never did shit for nobody but his friends and the few that eventually takes over the government. Uh, all the Anarchist says that I don't like government because I never read or saw any fucking thing he did that was consistent with the individual. So that's what anarchists do. A lot of people don't understand because he's a robot. He's been programmed. And when you talk about anything, for instance, somebody said, I asked, oh, what is it? Ask why. I see things that never were and ask why not. That's just not vague to me. If I was free, I would have that kind of ability to be creative, be able to contemplate, abstract, and conceptualize. 
But if God had conditioned me, not guys, I mean if the system and environment conditioned me, then I'm going to act just like I've been programmed. And I'm going to understand it like I've been programmed. We need a government because if it wasn't no government, people would be doing shit next. I, you go, I want you to go walk in the dark out of Englewood. You see, will your ass be protected? When you go home and somebody broke into your house, where was the police? We need the government. Ain't no way in the world that a group of individuals without government done killed the many motherfuckers that governments done killed over a lifetime of history. Amen. Ain't no way in the world I got a hundred dollar bill in my pocket. If you can give me half the evidence where whoever the tribes were, whoever killed as many people in the history of the world that is many governments have killed in the last 200 years. So don't tell me that I got to be have the government be saved. <laughs> People died every day. We done lost a, a thousands, thousands of soldiers over somewhere where we supposed no. to be. We done killed hundreds of thousands, thousands of people no. that ain't supposed to be dead. No. Like you said, even the police got open season on folks all over, all over the United States. And you gonna tell me that oh, this is the way it should be? Give me a break, please. If you were free, like an anarchist, and did your own thinking, you wouldn't be would be afraid to see what the truth is. How much evidence do you need? I mean, you like to, I hate to keep repeating this, the housewife. And oh, oh, my husband. Uh, the mother, my son would do that. Give me a break. Why don't you leave, somebody say. Uh, oh, my country. Why should I leave my country? Right or wrong? With wrong to be made right. And why? They don't go. All you've got to do is read or go somewhere. You see people, if you went over to Germany, you see a whole bunch of folk over there that wasn't born in Germany. If you went to Saudi Arabia, if you went to Ireland, they got so many black folks came to Ireland that I read a couple years ago, they got a black man in one of the cities over there. In Ireland, where you think they come from? Every got a whole bunch of black folks. A lot of them were born there now, but they wasn't. Uh, uh, Fifty years ago, it was probably wasn't enough to throw a, rack, uh, a rocket. They came there. All over the world, people go from here to there. Ever since the beginning of time, if you read the Old Testament, if you read history, people and like the speaker said, the fathers and shit wasn't no. Thirty seconds. Oh, you can't come here. You can't come here. People went. Anywhere they wanted to go because they could do better over there than they did over here. Or they was running from somebody with a with a, with a, 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 a sword in their hand. Syria got 300,000 people in the last six months that don't live in Israel no more. So that 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 means that where they went is heaven because people come to the United States. United States is heaven. United States. Is better than getting your ass blown up or getting your ass shot. That's what it is. And some poor your person. time, Dean. Oh, I'm sorry. Some poor person time. running here. That's one thing. But the rich folks not running here. Didn't, didn't brag about. It. Right on. Right on. <laughs> Actually, we live under the dictatorship of capital in the United States, and there's no doubt about it. You have one third of the country near or under the poverty level right now. You have the average corporation or banker pays about 25 cents in taxes, while the average person pays about a dollar in taxes. Yeah. So what type of society is this? It's based on exploitation of labor. That's what it's all based on. How do all these uh, so-called CEOs get all those millions and billions of dollars? They exploited labor. That's where they got it. If you don't exploit labor, you can't make a profit. That's what profit is based on. So the whole system is based on profit and they don't give a damn about human beings. It just uses human beings to make more and more profit. The United States has a thousand bases around the world. It's the biggest empire that ever existed. So people that talk about Germany and they talk about Italy and Japan being dictatorships, the United States is also a dictatorship of capital. That's all it really is. 
And what's the answer? The problem is what the speakers have said is all true. There's no doubt about it. But he doesn't give us an answer. Where's the answer to the problem? The answer is that people are exploited ought to run the economy. In other words, you have a factory, and in this factory you got a hundred people working. The hundred people that are working there should keep the profits. Except that what goes into, let's say, uh, health, roads, schools, and what they call the commons. And it ought to be uh, more or less under a plan because everything is under a plan. We live under laws, natural laws, and social laws. And people think that human beings are free. We're not free. We get our freedom from struggling against the, the inequities of society. That's where we get our freedom from. The government isn't going to give you anything. The government is a capitalist government. Anything that has ever been uh, solved has been solved through struggle. That's the only way you solve it. It's through people getting together and struggling against an inhuman system, an inhumane system. And by organizing and organizing a government that is not for profit, it's for human beings having a better life, to develop the economy, to get rid of this global pollution. How can a country be free if it's allowing the whole planet to die because of profit. For coal, for oil, for fossil fuels, they don't give a damn about the planet. That's all they care about is profit. And the thing is, this uh, type of system is, is structured for profit. You have to have another system, and the system that I believe in is scientific socialism. Somebody that doesn't understand it, and a lot of people don't because they've been so damn brainwashed, by the corporate media and the schools and the churches, and they don't understand the system, they don't understand Marx, they never read them, but yet they're against them. Read them. Get a book and start reading them and understand about society and what Marx discovered. Marx discovered the laws of matter, and he utilized, he utilized those laws in order to, to, to critique capitalism and to uh, put forward another system that's based on reality was a socialism. I get when you're ready, guys. Six minutes, Jeff. Okay, well, well. Um, in a minute or so, I'm going to um, elaborate on a theme, namely, I've got a whole bunch of respect for Francisco and also for Gene. And if you folks listened carefully to those two, you should have noticed a crucial difference in their drifting. Um, and I'll segue into that by first recalling some words of the speakers, of the speaker, to the effect that the difference between an anarchist and a libertarian is that the libertarians want to be capitalists and enslave others, whereas the anarchists yeah. don't. Insofar as, okay, evidently that's a fair description yeah. of, um, of, of what, what uh, a fair representation of, of what the speaker was driving at. Well, I'm not going to try to speak for all libertarians, but I will wager that the majority, and perhaps the vast majority, will say that that, that whole description is completely untrue. Okay. There are no doubt some libertarians who hate the government. There's probably quite a few who don't. There's probably quite a few who identify with guys like Tom Jefferson, whose attitude was that, well, government is a drag. Having no government at all is worse. And for, for starters, for the sort of reason that Frank alluded to in the beginning of his six minutes here. He brought up the example that maybe, maybe, if we only had a hundred people, we could work things out. And I gather that you would, you had in mind determining whether Joe Blow was guilty of a crime, and then if we determine he's guilty of a crime, what sort of thing, what we ought to do about it. Well, I'm, I'm tempted to say even a hundred folks might be, at least in some contexts, too many. 
the Anglo-Saxon legal system has juries of 12. Maybe getting much above 12 for the sort of thing we're talking that we're talking about here is really stretching it. But of course, Frank's larger point was that once you get up above 100 into 100,000, 100 million, which is what we've got in just about every country in the world now, there's got to be some sort of procedure, some sort of rules. We just can't all get together and be all warm and fuzzy about it. There's going to have to be some sort of rules for sorting out disagreements. And when you have 100,000 or 100 million people, the chances are overwhelming that in almost every case of any importance at all, you're going to get disagreements. So then what do we do? We don't have a consensus. How do we resolve the lack of consensus? Well, we can't, what are we going to do? Get together in a football stadium, 100 million people in a football stadium and hash it out? I don't think so. There's going to have to somehow, some way, be some sort of procedure, and it's probably going to have to be sort of bureaucratic anyhow, to resolve those situations where there is a lack of consensus. So Frank was on the right track there, and Gene, when you say, I gather that you're, you know, you meant to disagree implicitly with Frank on this. Um, when you talk about, well, okay, when did government ever do good for the people? Fair question. What I must say is, there have at least been times in human history, off and on here and there, such as in this country, let's say a generation ago, in the 50s and 60s, and 70s, all right, when you had guys like JFK and Jimmy Carter as president, when this country was at least making a rather better effort to make us have a peaceable resolution of our differences. I think those two guys did a hell of a lot better in moving the country toward that sort of thing than other governments have in history, such as Hitler, Stalin, Pol Pot. You know, we can just go on, the list goes on forever. So there have been some times in history when government, if it didn't, do something for the people in the most dramatic sense of that phrase, at least it did less damage than at other times. And it behooves us to try to weigh, well, okay, what sort of systems will make it so that we can d deal with these situations where there's no consensus, and where in the process of doing that, we do less damage rather than more. As far as I'm concerned, it's worth the effort, Guys like Tom Jefferson thought deeply about this. They came up with a system which continued to get better for roughly 200 years. Now, once Ronald Reagan ran Jimmy Carter out of town on a rail and passed out government contracts and this and that and the other thing to his pals, well, ever since then, this joint's been going down the drain. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, I've, I think I've said before to the likes of Tim that, yeah, yeah, we had a imperfect but not all that bad of a system for the first 200 years. But in the last roughly 30 years, they've been shitting all over it. And it's going down the drain, and there's no telling. Unless we're going to get one of three, three things, is my guess. We're either going to get the kind of revolution in the first instance that the speaker wants, although what will no doubt happen once that thing starts, is that some Stalin type will figure out how to game the thing and become the, the head on show. Or um, we'll have some sort of Orwellian state where the technology, yeah, I'm getting there, I'm about to, uh, uh, where the technology, where, where they, you know, big bro can see everything we're doing and damn near everything we're thinking. Okay, that's another possibility. And the third, and I, you know, I'm not crazy about saying about this, if we're lucky, we'll get a coup d'etat by a dude like Mustafa Kemal, who took over Turkey in the early 20s and actually straightened out a bunch of things and on balance made a bad situation not so bad. And wouldn't you know it, under his successor, Turkey set out the Second World War, although she'd been up to her neck in the First World War. So that was, you know, the, the guy put that country on the right road. So are, am I actually out of time now? You're out of time. Okay, cool. Okay.
right, well, I'd like to thank our speaker for, uh, for an excellent presentation. And even though I, I disagree with you about some things, uh, I certainly uh, admire your, your uh, hard work, you know, for something you believe in, uh, and your dedication and all that. I know that doing all that kind of stuff is, is an awful lot of hard work. Uh, now, I want to mention quick, quickly, Charlie, about uh, immigration. I'm, I'm more or less in the same camp that, you know, people should be able to travel f freely uh, across borders uh, to get, you know, the best price for their labor or their skills or whatever. However, I think it, but it, it does need, you know, it does need to be done legally. Uh, I, I don't want just people like, you know, walking in, in and out at nighttime, you know, we, it, the world is a dangerous place and uh, I think every country, you know, needs to know who's coming in and, you know, who's going. More who's coming in than who's going and what I'd be worrying you about. do that at the dollar. Of course, uh, all, my, all my relatives were immigrants. Uh, the ones that I know of anyway, at least were, were all legal. You know, they all came in here legally, uh, not on the Mayflower, but not too, not too long uh, uh, after that, though. But uh, they did come in legally and sign in. Uh, now, Frank, this business about bombing Dresden and Tokyo and all that, I want to recommend a great book called Downfall, which is uh, about, really, about the end of it is about the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. However, the beginning chapters, though, are about how bombing evolved in, more or less, you know, in modern warfare at that time in the 40s, and what made that necessary to bomb these population centers, how it ended up going that way. <laughs> and uh, I'll tell you, it's just the way, you know, those were, it was very difficult to bomb, at that day and time with that technology, it was very difficult to bomb specific factory targets. The bombs were fall. you know, if they were lucky, they would get a bomb like maybe a block away from a factory. You know, it was, it's extraordinarily difficult back then. So, and they were losing, if, if you do daytime uh, bombing raids and lower altitude raids, your, your guys would get shot down. And uh, so you had to, what the thing to do, what you could do is you could go up higher at nighttime and you could bomb cities and maybe get rid of the workers and, you know, and if you're lucky, maybe a few bombs would fall on the factories. And of course, then there was a thing where you just figured, you know what? We've got to get these guys to, to surrender. Let's make it so horrific that they will finally freaking surrender. Okay. So everybody's trying to do that too. But anyway, we read Downfall, and I can't remember the name of the author. There's a couple of books of named Downfall, but the one I'm talking about has a picture of an atomic explosion on the Curtis front. Of they, he's in there, and a lot of these, a lot of these guys are in there. And you'll read about the uh, the uh, conditions that the bombers had. I mean, it was freezing cold up there. In, in those high altitude bombing raids, you know, foggy windows. I mean, it was, uh, it wasn't, it was no pleasant thing. Oh, poor man. Now, um, and you know what, like I said, we had, and, and, oh, and we, and we oh, had to, you know, we oh, had to end the war. It was better that we ended the war in Japan because if it would have drug on, millions more would have died. They would have starved because they were not going to give up. They were going to go for a land war. They're, because of the way Japan is shaped, it's one big giant mountain range, and so the the rail lines are on the beaches in Japan. And if we were going to invade, we would be bombing, uh, shelling the beaches before we landed, and those rail lines would be getting blown up, and there would be no rice moving back and forth through the country, and the whole thing would have like two and a half million people started. So yes, it was better to bomb Hiroshima and Nagasaki and Tokyo and to kill about 40 or 80,000 people than to have this millions go on, plus all the, you know, all the our lives have, would have been lost too. After we had already been fighting for years and su suffered horrific casualties, we didn't want any more. Now I got to address uh, uh, Sid here for a second. Uh, I think Sid, like you should have been here last week, you're making the same mistake most other people on the left do. You're confusing capital with privilege. Now the reason that these guys are super wealthy and everything is not because they're exploiting labor. It's because they have privilege. They're granted certain rights uh, that other people don't have. They have 
you know, they're granted monopolies. Uh, they have favored tax status. There's a, there's a certain, they have a franchise of some kind. These are all privileges. This is all, these are all listed in the menace of privilege by Henry George Jr., which we're reading in the Political Economy Book Club. I suggest you read it and join us uh, January 20th or 23rd. Uh, to, at the Henry George School and discuss it. But this is why we're against privilege, because this privilege is what leads to the to these great masses of wealth. Now, for instance, you talk about, well, this is about exploiting labor, and that's how they got rich. Well, bullshit. I can show you storefronts near Michigan Avenue that cost $6,000 or $8,000 a month to rent. Now, there's no way in hell those buildings cost that much to maintain. Most typical... Uh, building expense, what, what you pay for rent, only about 25% of that goes for building and taxes. The rest is all just money going into the landlord's pocket, which is Ricardo's law of rent. The all access production uh, you know, goes to the landlord. Uh, so what we could do, and this would solve the prison problem and everything, is if we had a Henry George type system where we had nationalized the land, not the buildings or anything else, but if instead of the money you paid for rent, if that uh, to a private and see what's happening is we have we have economic rent going into the private pockets of men. Why not have that rent go to the government and we would not have to pay income taxes or sales taxes because what we pay in rent, 75% of that would go to uh, the funding the government. That would fuel an economic boom, and boom, their your, your right, prison is despair. Am I out of time? If I'm out. Oh, I haven't heard yeah, it. Have I got yeah. six yeah. minutes up already? Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Yeah. That's about yeah. 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 First of all, I would like to thank the speaker for at least being willing to take, come, take on this audience. Much like Daniel and the Lions Den. That's I disagree with virtually everything that he said, other than his concern for the prisoners. I don't think that anarchism is the way to go. I'm sorry, folks. We do need a government in this country and around the world by it is properly run, which is admittedly ours. And Jeff earlier alluded to the idea that things have been going downhill since at least the 70s. I disagree. I think they've been going downhill since 1963, since President Kennedy was killed. This country has been locked into a downward spiral ever since then, from which it has never really emerged. And I'm beginning to doubt now whether it ever will. But having said that, first of all, I don't believe that society should be taking the law in its own hands, which is what he or the speaker suggested when we can't get to cases like Jerry Sandusky. Um, what, society should form a lynch mob and try this guy? No. That has to be done with courts and lawyers, however imperfectly they function. Period. End of story. And I hope Jerry Sandusky is given a lengthy prison sentence, and from one from which he is, will not emerge. Now, with regard to the comments and criticisms that were made concerning my statements, concerning Dresden and Hamburg, First of all, a country that starts a war should never do it lightly. And it should always understand that, yes, that there will be consequences. For one thing, you may wind up losing the war. And that's what happened when the American South, for example, rebelled against the North and the Civil War started. They did not foresee that General Sherman would march down there and inflict terrible battle damage on these people. And my message to them was, what did you expect would happen? And nobody told Adolf Hitler or Benito Mussolini that they had the right to, or Hirohito, they had the right to annex and occupy other people's other countries. What did they expect would happen when they did that? And as has been pointed out, when a war starts, the only way to get it to stop frankly, is by killing as many of the enemy as you possibly can. And that's what happened at Dresden and Hamburg. I agree that that's horrible. But on the other hand, people quote only one part of what General Sherman said, war is hell. Actually, what he actually said was, war is hell, and you can't refine it into anything else. And 
no less than one of our biggest adversaries, Albert Speer, pointed out that we should have laid on three or four more raids on Germany like Dresden and Hamburg. It was the sovereign way to end the war. It was the sovereign way to get the Germans to surrender and stop the war in Europe. Period. And I will also say that for somebody who is constantly complaining about the manners of some of the people in this room at times, such people would do well to avoid making personal attacks on other people. I don't think that's necessary. Do you? Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I admire you, your work in the prison system and uh, volunteering it. It's uh, something that uh, especially is close to me. I used to work at the uh, DMH, but with a population that was incarcerated, mentally incarcerated. And I agree with you about the importance of having to feel having to treat those people as if they are human beings because they are uh, and they're suffering and uh, just to show them that um, you respect them you appreciate them you treat them equally like any other person in any other authority above them uh, gives the message and publish their their um, the work, their, their, their thoughts, is a wonderful way. So thank you for that. Um, as far as anarchism that became the topic, um, one of my uh, role models is Emma Goldman. Uh, what I admired about her is her defiance of authority. And I think it's very important for people to be able to get over the, I would say, animalistic tendency to cower to someone who seems to be more powerful, whether it's psychological or physical or money-wise. However, this is not reality. We are, there is a part in us as human beings that um, worships authority or power or money just for having it. And so since the beginning of man, people have organized. Since there were two or three, three people on earth, there was some organization. And I can't see a way to avoid organization. We call it government. Um, you mentioned communes. There were some communes, especially in the 60s. Um, they didn't, they broke down. Uh, where did it work was in a very, very, what we call primitive society, what we call the simple society, when communities of people were very small, clans, okay? They, they maybe had uh, 30, 40 people, they used to control, the control system was through shame, okay? If somebody messed up, uh, people would shame him, but, but physically it was possible. Now we have such a complex, large society that it's impossible. We have to organize. And once you organize, you accumulate power. And then you face with all the challenges that were mentioned here. And I agree with all of that. Uh, the question is, how can we still organize and still um, defer some power of authority, at least for protection and for facilitation, but have all those checks and balances without cowering to the authority by giving them privileges, okay? Um, this is the secret. I don't have the solution, but I know that without some organization, some government, I can't see how anything will function. Well, thank you.
Oh, all right. Yeah, we'll get moving. I'll just be very brief. Won't be very long. Thank you, Anthony. Very nice presentation, and thank you for standing up for an area that we certainly need more attention, and that's the rights of people who are incarcerated in this nation. One of the first speakers I ever scheduled was on the uh, issue of incarceration. I think we have reached one million prisoners, and I think it's at two million dollars, something like that and the figures are going in the wrong direction. Okay, I'm going to be eclectic and quick. Anarchy, yeah, there's a new book out by about Emma Goldman. Uh, anarchy at the turn of the century meant not no government, but a government that took the side of, let's say, the power and the privileged people versus the rest of us. And that's what they meant from anarchists. There were three entities the people, these rich Romney type individuals, the business interests, and the government. When the government and business get together, you're, you're in trouble. And I'm, certainly we don't want to do away with government. It has certain vital functions. I think the nationalization of industries, are you done, Bill? Let me know when you guys are done. Um, that, like here, transportation, certainly a nationwide network of railroads. I think I, pers per personal private transportation is nonsensical, but uh, there certainly is a function for government to roll in that, play in that. Also our personal safety and fire and things like that. I think what you're looking at though is let's focus on the judicial system or sometimes it's, it's it, I, it's also called the criminal justice system. And is it working? No, it certainly is malfunctioning. Um, is, it, is it an area you can legislate on? I'm, I'm a lobbyist. Do, do people in prisons really constitute a, a constituency that anybody cares about? Probably not. You know, it's a difficult thing to legislate the rights of individuals. Many people think they're put in prison and they work perfectly and they are guilty and deserving of this situation here. And that you couldn't be further from the truth. We're also talking here about justice. An abstract concept here it goes back to uh, Socrates tried to figure out what it is. Have we gotten any better of it? Hopefully, are we gotten perfect at it? By no means. Um, you know, there has to be reliance on law, whether you like it or not. Your gains have to be codified in the law. Um, but anyhow, how do we reform the judicial system? You know, it involves the courts, the certainly the law enforcement people, whatever, that's even a dangerous term. Um, you know, and then the, the horrible aspect of incarceration here. Getting rid of all government, I mean, obviously we don't want petty warlords. And I will focus on the last thing I like, is that, you know, I certainly am totally in a concurrence that the libertarians are simply want to exploit other people for their own personal gain and profit. And they think that's totally appropriate, and they don't want any interference whatsoever in their will ability to do so. Yes, this is a totally unethical situation. It demands the presence of government. It necessitates total and absolute regulation because you end up with a situ situation that's nothing but pure and total and absolute exploitation of others. They don't really care. And they pull some sort of mental exercise here, yada, 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 and think there's justification for the exploitation of another human being. I'm sorry, I'm not that dumb. I don't believe it. It's stupid. Give it up. Thank you very much, Dan. By the way, come again after, you know, you, you, you're doing a lot of work here. Talk to, you know, we didn't really present this as prisoner rights. Maybe you could really focus another presentation on that. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you All right. The Batarians on Wall Street. Oh, it's nuts. It's great. Hey, Anthony, well, uh, thank you for the great presentation. Yes, I also am an anarchist. I don't 
by and a lot of the stuff that has been said, that, oh, there's just way too many people, that we can't have an anarchist society. Uh, there's been a lot of mention about Noam Chomsky. He's done a, some very good programs about anarchism, and that one project, that was the Mondrian project or whatever, he did a great program speaking about that. I think, I don't think Madrid is a little small village or tribe, nor Barcelona. And they did have for four years, at least, uh, three to four years, they ran an anarchist society, and they did quite well. And the only problem was Stalin and those other guys, and and the left as well, because the left was didn't want the anarchists to succeed either. The anarchists could fight the right. I mean, the left can fight the right, but the left also wants power. And um, but back to the issue about prisons. And I think something that hasn't been touched on tonight is that uh, all of this was planned. This is it's not an accident that everybody in prison are black or Hispanic or poor. It's not an accident. It was planned. And I went to, uh, years ago, I went to a um, seminar given by these legal eagles, and they described how they planned it. They had the, the jails built five years before the before the prison boom, ready to accept all these people. It was planned, and why is it planned? Because there's a baby boom in these communities, and white privilege wants to hang on to what they have, and so it is genocide, and I think it needs to be looked upon that way. And as far as the judicial system not working, it's working like it's meant to work. It's, it's just grinding out, it's just this mill to criminalize people. I don't even believe in the whole concept of crime is ridiculous. And Clarence Darrow had something to say about that as well. There's no such thing as crime. And you got these big guys, if there is such a thing as crime, we're all criminals. And the biggest criminals never get punished, they get parades. They kill hundreds of thousands of people and we're like, yay! You know, I go kill my neighbor because he's fucked me over and I go, I go to jail for 50 years. So I think a whole lot of things, the problem is that we're so brainwashed and we're so used to being told what to do and we're so retarded, as Lucy Parsons says, government retards, they retard us. We are so retarded, we, we, we don't, that's why Anthony talks about needing education. We can't even think, we can't even imagine living free. We talk about we live in this great free country, some free country that criminalizes and, and puts in prison millions and millions and millions of people, not just in prison, but also just in the clause of the judicial system. And I don't think judicial lynching is, has anything over a regular lynching. Lynching is lynching. And when you, when, you, when you make it all nice and pretty and patine, oh, they went to court, and so of course it's okay. No, it's not okay. It's not okay because you just went through this factory uh, system where you got, you know, thrown in jail through railroading and, 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 and a system that is so powerful with the prosecutors and the judges and everything on their side and the, and the defense gets nothing. You don't have jails filled with rich people. People are in jail because they're poor, because they can't afford a defense. If they could afford a defense, they wouldn't go. They wouldn't be in there. You know, so that's not equal rights under the law. That's ridiculous. The law, laws, to me, are just a way for the people with power to keep their power and to keep the haves, to keep the haves safe from the have-nots. So thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Long live anarchy. Yeah. The have-nots. Uh, I am going to take a slightly different view tonight. Oh. Because if it wasn't for men like Cornelius Vanderbilt, oh. J.P. Morgan, or even the likes of Dale Carnegie, or in our latest realm of things, Mark Zuckerberg. Are we ready? Or what we shall say, Sergey Sergey Brin and Larry Page. What have they done? They started companies that provided jobs, that brought people to work, that actually got this country going. 35 years after the Civil War, the first guy in, let's say, Cornelius Vanderbilt, built the, I believe he built the railroads. No, they, no, no. Okay. There were men that built the railroads. They, they tried, did the financing that made the company that built the railroads. J.P. Morgan consolidated the electric industry through finance and the formation of a large company that employed thousands of men. And of course, 
Dale Carnegie and Carnegie Steel. Andrew. No, Andrew, Andrew Carnegie, I'm sorry. He stole a lot. Yeah, he, I mean, and of no, course, he right now, we take a look at Mark Zuckerberg, who did the biggest revolution in recent years called Facebook. Sir Gabriel and Larry Page, a company called Google. And of course, Bill Gates, the founder of the Microsoft Windows system, which powers about 90% of our computers today. These may not be men of these. These might not be men that you agree with, but they did change the world and did make it possible for you guys to have workers who were employed that you can now complain about and have workers' rights. If it wasn't for these men and who built this country and built this stuff, you guys would still be stuck in a plantation farm system. That's bad. Now, as far as my country is concerned, yes, it has problems. Yes, it has some big time troubles. But I'd still rather be here than in that workers' paradise of Cuba. Uh, I would still know. rather be here than in that workers' paradise of the Soviet Union. Because you can and will live free. You have more choice today, and I do understand that there are injustices. There are prisoners. There are things. But we've been through this before. We had a nice progressive area in the 20s with the labor unions and the whole bit. But you want to know who really changed things was Henry Ford. By paying his workers a decent wage and, of course, dealing with the unions to get an eight-hour day. But remember, he made the cars first and then the labor conditions improved. You need the unions to countervail the power of industry. But without the power of industry, you wouldn't even have a union or jobs. Thank you very much. You get the last word. You get the last word. Talk about justice. What Facebook got to do with justice? Sell Facebook short. <laughs> okay, speaker gets the last word. Rob a bear, but they should have been in jail. Uh, Carnegie, just like the people today on Wall Street. You wouldn't they have the modern industry right, without guys, those guys as bold the as Silver. Green is good. Don't tell Bob. They always tried to put Rockefeller in jail, at least they punished Give credit where it's due. Tim, <laughs> what do you think Carnegie did at all? Yeah. And on Christmas turkeys? He employed people to make steel, Charlie. He exploited people to make steel. There's a different special. He did get eventually bought off by U.S. Steel, which had a lot better union representation a few years later because you guys did your jobs. It's, it's time for the speaker to speak. Thank you. He killed all the idiots to shut up. Are you ready? I resemble that. All right, thanks a lot for all your attention and all this. Uh, and, you know, I don't really go around talking about revolution and we're going to have a government with no laws and no... That doesn't concern me. Uh, anarchism at its best is very highly organized. It's a lot of dedicated people. Like when, when we organize a big conference or something and we have maybe 20, 30 people doing all the organizing and everyone is involved, in, it's a complicated, tedious process. So everyone's voice can be heard and, and the input included in everything. It's, it's not a simple thing, not a simple utopian solution. But before we go anywhere near there, anywhere near a revolutionary situation of any sort, there's got to be some basic understanding among people, which is, is lacking unbelievably, which is why I focus so heavily on education, because there is none so far basically. Uh, for years, people didn't even know anarchism ever existed. They've been so beat down and murdered and quieted. All you knew about was the Marxist literature. During the 60s and 70s, I didn't know hardly anything about anarchism. I didn't read about it until all these texts were discovered and AK Press came along and a lot of this real history, this, the, this unknown history, like the Boleyn, great Boleyn book, come out and, and really discuss what these alternative to capitalism and communism 
ways of thinking really are and how they can really be adapted and, and made useful to modern day people in, in, in all walks of their life. I mean, everything I do, I sort of have the same mindset with what I'm doing. So that's basically what's so good about it for me is it's, it's a tool of, of thinking and how you comport yourself in, in all your activities. You use, you, you're clear-sighted about it. You're, you're looking to, is this good for people? Is this bad for people? What are the, all the issues? What's all everything involved? Who's, who's doing what? what? You, you make all these connections. It's not, it's not just, you know, being for this or against that or all these people or all those people. Everyone is an individual, and everyone de deserves their own individual respect. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, anyway, I'm gonna just finish with a couple of brief little uh, pieces of, of prisoner writing. Now this one here is from Conflicts of Interest. This is just sort of the, the beginning of this zine. This is written by a fellow named Kakalalo Makalui. I guess he's. Uh, you know, Ask the land, Mexican. I am the one without shelter, the one left to swelter. I am the abused with no choices to choose. What do I got to lose? I am the one who hungers, the one who thirsts, the so-called worst of the worst. I am the one who will ride in a hearse first. I am the forgotten, the misbegotten, considered rotten. I am the sick, the diseased, the depraved, and the deprived. I am the one to be thought the lesser by the oppressor. I am the repressed, the one who was passed by and passed on. I am the one they claim wants a handout with my hands out. They claim I am the helpless, so I'm worthless. But I am the one who is wise to society's lies. I am the one who is strong in heart and rich of mind. I am the one who is not blind. I am not resigned to fall in line. I am the one with understanding and insight, the one who will fight and shine a light in the dark. I am the one who leaves a mark, the one who cries out and demands to be heard. I am the one who spreads the word. I am the one who knows struggle, who continues to strive. I am alive and refuse to go unrecognized. I am the many. I am worldwide. I am something you cannot hide. I am poverty. This one has a similar tag, called Smoke Blown. Her watery words were larded with lies. The cold and calculated diffidence in her persona was to fool only fools, but never the wise. We've been down that well-trodden road many times before. Enough time to know when smoke is being blown. The things that at first glance seem alluring can oftentimes be quite dreadful upon a closer examination. Though she may be unduly revered by the unseeing and the unknowing, she has become abominated by those who have already felt the ice-cold tactility of her suffocating embrace. One slight glance upon her uncaring, opaque eyes would be a definite result in one's ultimate demise. High and mightily, she sits on her preemptory throne, looking down on her civilized society with a subtle hint of unhinged brutality. More is the pity for those who do not obey, I'd say. They'd be lucky to be thrown into a prison, never to see another sunshiny day. Dishonest, dishonorable, despicable, manipulative, cruel, and vindictive, conniving, condescending, and carnivorous is she. What is her name, you ask? Well, surely, my friend, you've heard of her before. Her name is Authority. Alright, that's it, folks. Good night. All right. All right. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for your remarks and contributions. Take that. I mean, I feel like that's full of. Right here, like that.